some of the compulsory circles here at the beginning. But I want to welcome folks to the uh, April meeting of the Science Advisory Board, still virtual. Uh, we hope that this is potentially the last month that will be virtual. And it was uh, done virtually this time to accommodate a couple of the board members uh, when we polled you. So thanks to Peter and Louise and Franny for the work to help make a virtual meeting happen. And we'll talk a little bit at the close about hopefully the pivot back to in-person meetings in Raleigh in the Archdale building, starting with the uh, June meeting. Uh, we'll have a record of attendance at our first vote. The uh, only person that I've heard from in terms of not being present is that uh, we learned last month that Davin Madden has uh, resigned from the board. He's taken a new job outside of the public health sector. And so um, the position that he fills was in part uh, associated with being a, uh, serving as a county health director and being part of the North Carolina Association of Local Health Directors. So folks at DHHS and DEQ will work on filling that. Uh, I've already extended our thanks to Davin for his service with us, and we'll do that um, more formally in correspondence uh, in the future. Uh, but other than that, uh, I don't know of anybody else uh, who uh, wasn't going to be with us today. Uh, so let's see, I think that removes us to item two on the agenda to uh, review and approve the agenda, which Louise has on the screen. Thank you. There haven't been any modified versions of this or no suggested modifications from the version that I sent out um, this time last week. Well, it's not working. Lee. Um, start teams. Elena, we're here and do you need some assistance? anybody needs help with any of the uh, IT portions of it, you can put something in the chat or uh, reach out to Peter or Louise. Um, David Dorman and uh, Detlef Kanapi have both joined as attendees. So if you'll move them up, Peter, that would be great. Thank you. Okay, they are both attendees now. Welcome, Detlef. Hello. I have to unmute. <laughs> Quite all right. We're getting everybody together and welcome, Dave. Glad your uh, teaching schedule at the tech school allowed you to join today. Well, I hope to leave in about an hour. All right. Well, we'll get through some of the business then before then. We're at uh, item two on the agenda, which is to reboot, review, and approve the agenda. I was just saying that it hasn't been modified since the version that I sent out uh, this time last week. Are there any comments on the agenda or questions? And uh, uh, Tom, this is John Vandenberg. Just a quick suggestion, maybe not for this meeting, but for the next one. I think it would be good for the board to get an update from DEQ, DHHS about the hexavalent chromium report that we did about a year ago, just to see what the status of that is. Thank you. We can include that in DEQ and DHHS updates for next time, um, if it's a tidbit and if it's a larger presentation based on what's occurred or questions, it could be a standalone item. So we'll capture that in the notes. Thank you, John. Thank you. In terms of the agenda for today, if there aren't any questions or modifications, it would be appropriate to entertain a motion to approve it as drafted. Uh, John Vandenberg, so moved. Is there a second? This is Jamie, I second. Thank you. I think it's still our process in a virtual meeting context that we uh, take a vote by verbal roll call. So uh, the motion is on the floor and seconded to approve the agenda as drafted. Uh, Dr. Anasia? Uh, yes. Thank you. Dr. DeWitt? Present. And uh, okay with the. Uh, yeah, yeah, sorry, yes. <laughs> gotcha. Dr. DeGiulio? Yes. Dr. Dorman? Yes. Dr. Kenyon? Yes. 
Dr. Kimball. Yes. Dr. Kanapi. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Starr. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Stiskoff. May need to, uh, Louise, if you don't mind sending uh, Michael a note to see if he intends to join or is on, or sometimes he's on remotely and only able to use chat. Certainly will. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Tilson. Yes. Thank you. And Dr. Vandenberg. Yes. All right. So the agenda is approved as adopted. And that moves us to the ethics statement, which uh, I'll read for us. And uh, then we'll pause and see if anybody has anything that they would like to declare. And I need to pull that up on my own screen here. In accordance with the State Government Ethics Act, it's the duty of every board member to avoid both conflicts of interest and the appearances of conflict. If any board member has any known conflict of interest or is, in aware, or is aware of facts that might create the appearance of such conflict with respect to any matters coming before the board today, please identify the conflict or the facts that might create the appearance of a conflict to ensure that any inappropriate participation in that matter may be avoided. And then if at any time any new matter raises a conflict during the meeting, please be sure to identify it at that time. So uh, with that, the floor is open for anybody who uh, has anything to share with regarding the actual or appearance of a conflict for the matters uh, on our agenda today, most of which are presentations informational. Hi, Tom. I have a few items. Also letting you know that I am still present. <laughs> um, so I just wanted the board and anybody attending to know that I do receive both state and federal funding for the study of PFAS. I currently am serving on the US EPA PFAS Science Advisory Board, which is considering maximum contaminant level goals at the federal level. I also do serve and have served as a plaintiff's expert witness in cases involving PFAS. Thank you, Jamie. Anyone else? Um, this is Detlef, and uh, I also receive state and federal funding to study PFAS, um, both in the context of occurrence and remediation and human exposure. Thank you. And we do have a PFAS topic on the agenda uh, later today with regard to the process for deriving reference doses and then kind of reaching back to presentations that we had in August when uh, there was an, a, uh, an evolution of the table on the PFAS that are most common in North Carolina in terms of what we know. So I think there'll be a convergence of those later. Uh, technical presentation, but certainly an opportunity for feedback. Anyone else? Okay. We're at uh, item number four in the agenda, which is the um, look back at the meetings, at the minutes from our last meeting, which were drafted by Louise and revised by Franny Nilsson. Thank you both for that. Uh, they were distributed by me with the agenda last Monday. I haven't received any um, suggestions for uh, additions, deletions, modifications but I'll open the floor in case there are questions or edits that are needed before we vote to adopt them as final. If folks are happy with them the way that they've been uh, drafted, then I'd entertain a motion to adopt them as such. I'll move to uh, make a motion to adopt the minutes as. So, hang on, Betsy, who has a motion? Was there um, a question or comment about the minutes? I didn't catch who else was talking. Well, 
Well, I did hear Betsy um, make a motion to adopt them. We can see if there's a second for that, and then I can pause and see if there's any discussion uh, because there was another comment there. Is there a second to Betsy's motion to adopt the minutes as written? Yes, Dave Dorman, I'll second that motion. Thank you, Dave. Uh, I had a jacket to wear today to look really sharp, but the meeting crept up on me. Um, your tie reminded me I could have stepped my game up maybe during a break. Uh, is there any discussion about the motion on the floor to adopt the minutes as drafted? All right, well, then let's vote. Uh, Bining? You may be on mute. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, yes. Thank you. Jamie? Yes. Rich? Yes. Thank you. Dave? Yes. Elena? Yes. Thank you, Dave and Elena. Gina? Yes. Detlef? Yes. Thank you, Gina and Detlef. Tom? Yes. Thank you. Um, has Michael been able to join? Betsy, who made the motion? Yes. And John? Yes. Thank you all. All right. Well, um, the minutes then are final from the February meeting. Uh, they've got links to all the presentations that we received, which talked about how Guidelines are derived a lot of helpful re reference material in there for which we thank the departments and uh, Louise, if you can. Uh, post those on to the website, um, we'll have the, that be current. Uh, with that, we are now on agenda item 5, which are updates from the agencies we serve. Um, Division of environmental quality and DHHS. I do see that we're joined by. Assistant Secretary Shushma Mesmore, who's um, joining amongst another meeting. And so I'll turn it over to Shushma. And thanks for joining us this morning during a busy week. Thank you, Dr. Osberger. Can you hear me well? I can hear you perfect. Great. Um, I will give you all a, um, an overview of our division's activities related to PFAS. Uh, since that is primarily today's uh, agenda items. Um, in our Division of Water res uh, Resources, um, during the first quarter of 2022, the division staff sampled 70 groundwater wells in the lower Cape Fear River Basin counties. This includes New Hanover, Pender, Columbus, uh, and Brunswick counties. Currently, preliminary results from 55 wells at 25 locations showed attachment C. These are the Kamora signature compounds uh, that are in the consent order. Uh, these compounds were detected at less locations than total PFAS, but are widespread in higher populated areas with water uh, and sewer service. Also, uh, in the, since November 3rd, uh, DEQ had requested Comores to respond to a drinking water um, sampling plan and a framework for offsite assessment in those, these four counties. Comores submitted this response and we provided comments uh, related to these four, four county sampling and drinking water plan uh, to assess the Table 3 PFAS in, in New Hanover, Brunswick, Columbus, and Pender counties. Uh, we have requested revisions for both of these submittals. Uh, one has been provided and we're in the process of reviewing that. Comores noted in a recent call with DEQ that 75 requests for private well sampling have come in from the lower Cape Fear re region. Again, this is related to the four county sampling and drinking water plan. Of these 75 requests, 65 are currently eligible according to Comores criteria, which we're still working to revise for sampling based on their proximity to the river or a municipal water or sewer system. Of these 65, 54 wells have been sampled by Comores, with 16 wells having analytical results available thus far. 15 wells are non-detect for PFAS and one well has um, identified PFMOAA at 19 parts per trillion in New Hanover County. 
this resident has been offered bottle, bottled water. The work continues to sample um, private wells uh, around these four counties under the current um, plan that has been, uh, is, is still under review. DEQ received the 90% design submittal for the Camorra's barrier wall that is planned for along the Cape Fear River last week. Uh, DEQ continues to evaluate the modeling files for the barrier wall and its effectiveness and the performance of its ability to uh, contain and uh, reduce the PFAS loading into the river from groundwater contamination. We're also reviewing the quality assurance plans and the related performance monitoring plan. We are also in the process of finalizing our review of the aquatic and rodent toxicology protocols that were submitted by Comores. We really appreciate the input from many of the SAB members and the scientific community who are helping with this review. Uh, related to the barrier wall that I mentioned, uh, Comores has uh, uh, a uh, requested a, an, an NPDES permit. Our Division of Water Resources have issued a draft permit for outfall 004. Uh, this particular permit allows uh, requires remediation of the contaminated seep waters and the extracted groundwater from wells behind the proposed barrier wall. The draft permit was publicly noticed on uh, March 27th, a uh, week ago, uh, and the comment period will end on May 2nd. Uh, we continue to monitor the public comments and their request for a public hearing if it is requested. Uh, DWR's PFAS sampling work at groundwater wells that are within the agency's monitoring network, network will continue throughout this year. And that includes areas outside the four counties that I just mentioned. The final QA data will be posted on our website as they become available. And then finally, with our division of air quality, uh, that division continues to collect deposition data near field to the Camorra facility. Uh, we continue to collect background deposition data at each of our seven regional offices. To date, PFAS is infrequently found in these samples, and if, de if we detect any PFAS, it is usually in the single-digit PPT range. Those data are posted on our website as well. And finally, I'd like to say that the DEQ Secretary's Office and all of our division leadership and their staff continue to interact with EPA, the North Carolina Collaboratory, uh, other uh, scientific bodies within the state and across the um, across the nation, including our partnership with various states that are in a similar position as North Carolina or have taken a variety of actions. Uh, we are working with them and are in close communication, as well as coordinating to bring the best knowledge, process, and procedures for our making advancements related to PFAS. I hope this was uh, helpful. I'm happy to answer questions. I also wanted to respond to um, the question related to hexavalent chromium. Um, we, are, have, we have reviewed the report and have prepared um, some general statements regarding our review and our recommendations for next steps. And we would like to present that in a, in a more fa formal fashion in the next uh, SAB meeting. So we will do that for, for your benefit. And thank you for all that work that you did for us. That's all, Dr. Augsburger. Thank you, Shishma. Uh, questions? We have time for questions before we move on to DHHS. Um, Shishma, this is John Vandenberg. Thank you very much for the for that update. Um, I guess my and, and about hexavalent chromium as well. I guess my question is that right around the time we had our last meeting was when there was the fire in Winston Salem at the Weaver um, pesticide plant or fertilizer plant. My my question really is is how does the state respond to that kind of an emergency event? Do you have a mobile monitoring air quality sampling system or something like that? Or is it really depending, of course, on the firefighters working to manage the fire? But what is the state's role in that kind of an event? Can you just kind of give us a sense of that? Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, um, we, if, if, if needed, we can provide a, a presentation in a, in a, in a more more detailed discussion on how the state responds. In this particular case, um, and our air quality folks are here, and I'll, I'll pass this on to Michael Pachetra in a moment. In this particular case, um, the situation was in a was in the purview of a local 
uh, air quality program for Scythe County. Um, and we do not at DAQ, DAQ have the ability to monitor uh, through a mobile um, system, but EPA as well as the local air quality folks were involved as, as well as our, our division air quality staff uh, to collectively respond to ambient monitoring um, during the event and after the event. Um, I will ask Michael Pajetra to add a little detail to, to the ambient monitoring during that uh, at that site. Michael? Yes, thank you, Sushma. Michael Pajetra, Deputy Director with the Division of Air Quality. Good morning, everyone. Um, so with the um, Weaver fertilizer fire uh, starting uh, the very next morning, uh, we initiated had calls with the Forsyth County um, Environmental Affairs Department. Minor Barnett is uh, the Director of the Air Quality Group, uh, as well as with EPA Region 4 and uh, on-site uh, EPA um, assessment staff. We had those calls every day uh, monitoring uh, air quality results that uh, the EPA had set up a monitoring system around the facility in a one mile uh, radius, uh, four different sites. And then as the uh, situation uh, started to get better, they were able to move in and do more monitoring closer into the site. So really what we had was a very layered approach where the emergency management folks in Forsyth County uh, were obviously the lead at the beginning with the fire. Uh, EPA Region 4 staff um, were able to come in and set up a monitoring uh, uh, situation around the facility. Forsyth County um, Environmental Affairs, it was the lead organization. We were there for support as well. And we also offered uh, some monitoring equipment in terms of particulate monitoring, uh, but it was the uh, EPA's uh, monitoring that uh, was very substantial and uh, we appreciate their efforts as well as Forsyth counties. I will say that at the last environmental management committee meeting, um, uh, the air quality committee meeting, uh, Minor Barnett gave an excellent uh, um, a summary presentation of the entire event. And uh, so that's something that uh, may be available to view or uh, we could discuss the potential for uh, him providing the same kind of presentation to this board. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, again, it's John. I, I think it would be great to see that presentation if it is available. Uh, Cause you know, that's a, I, I think that the Winston-Salem fire chief said it was a, a fire of his career kind of thing. It was a big event. And so that's, of course, very concerning to the local population, but how the different layers, as you said, of government responded, I think is very important to understand. So thank you very much for sharing that. And if I may, while we're on this topic, let me call on our director, Michael Scott, to give a overview of how um, his team responded to the uh, to the event uh, during and after. Michael. Yes, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Michael Scott with the Division of Waste Management. And as Michael mentioned, you know, several divisions responded um, to the Weaver fertilizer plant fire. Um, we had several programs within the Division of Waste Management, the Solid Waste Program, and also the Hazardous Waste Program responded initially um, through our emergency management contacts. Um, we have been, still been engaged with the Weaver Fertilizer Plant Site regarding material management decision points, meaning certain materials that need to leave the site for disposal including fertilizer. Um, more recently, we've been involved regarding some um, initial environmental assessment questions that have come in regarding the site, um, the follow-up to the fire that occurred. And so we've had specific inactive um, has the site branch staff coordinating with Weaver um, and their consultants regarding additional uh, assessment information that may need to be obtained for informed decision making next steps. So, in summary, several different programs involved um, from the early emergency management stages through the fire, now more so in a material management items leaving the site for proper disposal and also um, additional environmental data that may need to be collected um, at the request of Weaver regarding assessing the site post fire. Hope that helps and, and be glad to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the question, John, and for the responses, Shishma, uh, Michael, and and uh, and Michael. Are there other questions for DEQ at this point? Uh, Tom, this is Bina and Aja. If All I right. could, yes, fine. Go ahead. Um, uh, 
Thank you very much, uh, Shushma and your team for uh, providing this information on the fertilizer file. Other than having mentioned that particulate matter was sampled, were there any carcinogenic issues that need that the division or DHS is concerned about, or, uh, uh, or what are some of the other pollutants that got measured that are of interest to human health? Indonesia, are you referring to the Viver uh, fertilizer plant uh, yes, situation? Indeed. Yes, indeed, Shushman, that's what I'm referring to. So, thank you very much for the clarity. Sure. Um, thus far, um, I have not heard from any of our divisions or the public or uh, the, uh, the the groups we've been involved with with a, with a need for a further look. However, we do want to do a, uh, a post event analysis to determine. Um, what we are, what we saw in the monitoring to see if there are any uh, residual questions or concerns. Um, we will look at that and, and get back with you related to your question. Thank you very much, Shushma. Sure. Thank you, Bina and Shushma. Any other questions for DEQ before we move on to DHHS? All right, well, let's move on to uh, Division of Health and Human Services. And I know that uh, both Zach and Virginia are on the phone. Uh, so I'll turn it over to whoever's going to give that update. Hey, <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Chairman Augsburger. And um, I, I can start and then uh, Virginia can certainly jump in. Um, I guess I'll just briefly mention um, that to follow up on Dr. Vandenberg's question that there was, um, in addition to all the coordinated efforts across DEQ, that response was um, also involved, of course, North Carolina emergency management, as was mentioned, and then a uh, coordination with our public health preparedness and response colleagues, and then work with our occupational and environmental epidemiology branch, led by Dr. Guidry, um, to work with the local health department on, um, on public health advisories and then from our health hazards control unit and environmental health to, um, um, to help with assessment for potential, uh, lead or asbestos. Contamination, so just to note that that was a, um, definitely a significant, um. Event and 1 that, um, uh, I think we can agree had potential to, uh, to be. Um, could have been a lot more sort of immediately um, hazardous, but but still um, still had important uh, lessons learned. And so I think I appreciate the question and the opportunity to um, maybe um, talk more about about how the um, state and local and federal entities coordinate around those. Um, I will keep my. Other updates brief. I have been giving a uh, sort of COVID update on these calls, so I will um, do that again now very briefly. Um, I think everyone is aware we've had um, a period of sustained decline. We had about uh, sort of nine weeks of rapid decline of most of our COVID metrics after the peak of the um, after emergence of. The peak we saw after emergence of Omicron, uh, which happened sort of mid January. Um, so that's been encouraging to see. Uh, we have leveled out kind of plateaued in most of our metrics over the past 2 to 3 weeks. Um, so we are still seeing um, very low numbers in terms of our. COVID hospitalizations, which is, is very encouraging. Um, we have nationally, well, I guess I'll internationally seen big. Um, surges happen again in, in several parts of the world, including um, in Asia, particularly in China and Korea, and then also increases in um, in Europe, which have gone along with the emergence of a new newer sub variant of Omicron that's called BA2, which um, the evidence suggests is more transmissible than the 
um, the subvariant that that was responsible for the initial surge. Um, that BA2 subvariant has now become predominant here in the um, in the United States as well. So we are watching to see what impact that might have on our trends. Um, I guess the other news to date, you know, lots of more questions than answers still, but uh, does not appear that that subvariant is any different in terms of severity compared to the um, the Omicron that we've been seeing over the past um, few months now. Uh, also appears that there are not um, major impacts on immunity following um, following vaccination with the BA2 subvariant based on the um, some of the early data, particularly out of the United Kingdom. So that's something that's being monitored very closely. Uh, and then um, with just the very large amount globally of virus that's in circulation, we're monitoring for emergence of other variants. You know, the more um, infected people we have out there, the greater likelihood there is for um, new variants to emerge. And we're tracking in particular concerns about some of the what are called recombinant viruses that are um, viruses that have um, some of the genetic sequence from from either two different sub two different variants or two different sub variants. Um, so there are uh, most of those have not really seemed to uh, to take off in a considerable way, but there there are um, some of those particular viruses that are of concern in terms of possibly. Um, having a faster rate of growth and potential for overtaking the the BA2 subvariant. So that's all um, things that we are are watching very closely. But you know we remain very encouraged by the um, progress we've made over the past uh, past couple months. Um, we are continuing to expand our wastewater monitoring um, capacity. And that's led by Dr. Gidry and her team in the occupational and environmental epidemiology branch. Um, so that includes expanding the number of, of sites, the municipal sites that are monitoring for um, for the SARS-CoV-2 virus in municipal wastewater, um, and also uh, working on improvements to our ability to do sequencing and look at uh, to do surveillance for um, for newer emerging variants in. Uh, in our wastewater, along with um, with our efforts to do that, and in, in specimens that come from uh, infected people. Um, so, overall, good news. But as always, we are um, watching closely to see um, to see what the future will will hold with uh, with our COVID trends and our COVID response. I, I will just mention um, that we have uh, released sort of a brief. Um, plan kind of reframing our COVID response uh, moving forward together, which some of you might have seen, um, which is available up on our website, uh, basically acknowledging that we are at a different phase in that in this response and moving away from measures to mitigate collective risk to focusing on uh, empowering individuals to take actions to reduce their uh, likelihood of exposure and protect their protect their health. Also focusing on maintaining our health system capacity so that um, that's available, not just if we have another COVID surge, but also for um, all the other uh, reasons why people may need to access uh, hospitals or other parts of our health system. Um, we're going to be focused, continuing to focus very much on collaboration with our local partners and um, working with all the groups that have been engaged with the response to date and on prioritizing equity uh, recognizing that we have continued throughout the pandemic to see disparate impacts on certain populations, particularly uh, historically marginalized populations, and working on um, on making sure that we have the data to track that track those disparate impacts going forward, and that we're directing our resources appropriately to those who are at the highest risk. Um, so that's sort of COVID in a nutshell. Um, we. Also, maybe I will just mention briefly, um, but not directly uh, environmental related, but certainly um, certainly there is overlap. We have um, our first outbreaks of highly pathogenic avian influenza in commercial poultry flocks in North Carolina. Um, we had been tracking 
protection of, of those avian influenza viruses in, in wild waterfowl over the past few months, sort of uh, up and down the eastern seaboard. And uh, North Carolina and several other states have unfortunately now had outbreaks in commercial poultry flocks. Um, so we in uh, public health are um, assisting with that response and particularly with monitoring of staff that, that respond to those events. Um, fortunately, there have been no detections of this particular virus in humans, um, but we are um, continuing to, to monitor um, any illnesses that may develop in people who are exposed. Um, on the, well, uh, I won't mention, there's work going on still on, uh, on fish consumption and um, working on possibilities for development of fish consumption advisories that I won't get into now as uh, Kennedy Holt will be sharing a presentation on that shortly. Um, and I think that is all I will mention uh, unless uh, Dr. Gidry has anything to add. Oh, I'm sorry, I will just briefly say uh, we uh, appreciate it being, uh, having the opportunity with the EQ to, uh, to be in Wilmington last week and talk with some of the um, local officials and members of the local community about some of the activities around PFAS now, and we're um, going to be doing more coordination with local health departments um, also in it. <clears throat> anticipation of the um, expected new health advisory level for Gen X from EPA. So that's uh, another area of focus currently. I will stop there. Let's first questions. Are there any questions for Zach uh, on DHHS or anybody else from DHHS? I think Virginia was going to. Add to it time. Well, thank you for the um, update. Uh, all of us are uh, certainly uh, weary from two years and hopeful as we enter a third year of living with COVID, but that was just us we didn't have the added responsibility of uh, interpreting health guidance and crafting public uh, processes going forward. So for those of you at the HHS, uh, Zach, Virginia, your colleagues, Betsy on our board, we thank all of you for your, your work and are hopeful that it'll be better times ahead. I think then that that moves us to uh, the next item on the agenda, which is a presentation. Uh, in introducing it, I also wanted to mention that we have four people that agreed to spoke or signed up to speak. Four people that signed up to speak at the public forum at the end of our meeting today. Uh, one of those, Beth Marcino, was interested in talking about this particular topic, fish consumption advisories. So, although we could hear that at the end, if there's time, we could also take those comments following this presentation so that they're closer in time to the material being presented. So uh, that's a possibility. I just wanted to mention it now in case that helps with preparation. Uh, the board's science advice uh, is advice intended to help you know thread a needle for managers at DEQ and the HHS. Last meeting, we had a lot of presentations on the processes for which uh, rules are developed for groundwater and surface water for protection of the environment and human health. The science advice is probably best tailored when it uh, is informed by what the processes are by which the state uh, does their work. And uh, have a continuation of that today with an overview of the processes by which the state does consumption advisories. Uh, for for fish, this could be consumption advisories for emerging contaminants that we're hearing a lot about, or they could be consumption advisories for compounds that have been with us um, for a long time, but because of their persistence, are sometimes a concern. So we're joined by Kennedy Holt, who was introduced to us last time as a 
having a new job with NDHHS, who has a presentation on developing fish consumption advisories in North Carolina. And Kennedy, if you want to entertain questions as we go through or have people hold them at the end, that's entirely up to you. Just let us know how we can facilitate. And uh, Elena, I'll mention that I think you have two different lines open, one of which is muted and one of which isn't. So sometimes there's a, you're showing up on my screen and, and I didn't know if it was that you're trying to speak or if there's just one open line. So Kennedy. Yes. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you, Tom, for introducing me. Uh, sure. So <clears throat> I'll just uh, go ahead and get started here. So hopefully we can uh, maybe get some questions in there if needed. And I am all right if people have questions while I'm on a slide or given a specific point, just because it's typically easier than shuffling back through them later. Um, so well, then let's have folks put those in the chat so that it's not just a total interruption. And uh, I'll try to get your attention if it's one that seems particularly timely. Okay, it sounds great. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen here. All right. Um, everybody can see this? We can. Um, and it's in the proper mode where we're seeing the big slide and not your notes. So good All job. right. <laughs> it sounds, it sounds great. All right. Uh, so thanks again, everybody. Uh, again, I'm Kennedy Holt. I'm an environmental toxicologist with DHHS. And Today, I'm going to be going through our fish consumption advisory process. Um, and at the end, I'll kind of um, tie it back into PFAS and Gen X, because I know that's um, one of the things that a lot of people are concerned about. Um, and I know um, the afternoon sessions are going to be uh, talking about PFAS as well. Um, so, without that, so with that, uh, let's get started. So, as a general overview of our summary of approach when developing fish consumption advisories, um, there's multiple reasons that we may do this. Um, there's routine sampling um, that occurs through DEQ, um, updating old advisories that we may have for various water bodies, uh, responding to citizen requests um, when there are concerns about potential pollution or contamination in a water body. Um, and then just also just understanding potential risks to reduce exposure to contaminants in fish. So when we are um, dealing with unknown uh, contaminants or chemicals, uh, want to kind of gain a better understanding to help inform uh, consumption amongst folks. Uh, and then uh, one of the important things that is kind of to be stressed throughout this is the sampling that goes into it. So we do have minimum needs when we're doing these consumption advisories, um, either fish, um, five fish fillet samples um, for each trophic level. So that's a single fillet from five different fish or three different composite samples for each tro trophic level. So that's when a composite sample is when you take multiple fish from the same species um, and get the tissue together to make a composite for that. And so three composite samples. So those are the minimum needs um, in order to develop an advisory. And just overall, the timing for this whole process, um, and this will be um, kind of shown a little bit later, but it can take anywhere from three to eight months to, for this whole process from start to finish to go through um, going here. And so this is kind of um, a general uh, workflow um, here that uh, we have, and this kind of shows um, why it may take a long time to do this, where it starts with sampling requests, and then once we have that request, developing a sampling plan, and this is something that we do with our partners at DEQ uh, in the North Carolina uh, Wildlife Resource Commission and Marine Fisheries. Um, Sometimes it takes a lot of uh, coordination to develop that sampling plan because uh, we have to determine what species we're looking at, um, what people are typically collect, or collect, when I say collecting, what people are catching and eating. Um, so we wanna make sure we're capturing all of that. Um, and then once we develop that, that plan, we, uh, the sample collection is done and that is typically done, um, again, with partners at DEQ or the Wildlife Resource Commission, Marine Fisheries to get those samples. Um, then those samples are collected, um, analyzed, um, Prepared and we're given um, concentration from the, that tissue data. Um, and then just make sure that there are adequate number of samples for us to do the work. Um, 
and then we go through do the work um, develop the fish consumption advisory review it with um, risk managers and make sure that everything's appropriate people are, um, that are informed and then we'll issue the the advisory at that point once it's been approved and once that um, and this is kind of um, occurring at the same time it's not we don't just issue the advisory and then tell people is this kind of um is a tandem process where when we're issuing the advisory we notify local health directors deq wildlife resource commission uh communications um folks of the public information officers for uh the dhhs and deq so that all this information is going out concurrently so that everybody all the potential stakeholders are notified at the same time we don't want it to be kind of a piecemeal process where somebody learns and then another person learns um, so again um, this is kind of highlights some of those um, that workflow here again um, not the repeated all but just so um, people can kind of see it spelled out a little bit more um, but again, coordination with different um, different partners to help design and sample everything. Um, and then the samples are collected, prepared, and analyzed. And then they are submitted to us at OEB uh, to review. And then we take those uh, concentrations, that fish tissue data, and we uh, use it to look at screening levels. Um, and <clears throat> this will be something that's expanded on a little bit later. But the health screening levels are for contaminants that we I guess are um, more routinely deal with as Tom kind of alluded to dealing with either contaminants that are been there for a long time but bioaccumulate. Um, we can have screening levels that are developed so we can kind of see kind of the floor at which we will consider um, doing a fish consumption advisory. Because um, if it's below that screening level, then there's really, really minimum risk, health risk involved with that. But if it's above that screening level, um, we can then go through the process of developing what the actual meal limits are, what the consumption advisory may be. Um, and then once we do that work, we then uh, disseminate that consumption advisory to the various stakeholders and the public. So going kind of um, dissecting these, these, um, these different steps a little bit more and going through a little bit um, more details and so as I talked about, the fish collected are those that are commonly um, are the ones that are to be commonly consumed by fishermen that are in that designated waterway. And the reason we we want to target that specifically is fish consumption advisories are developed for um, subs um, under the assumption that somebody is a subsistence um, fisherman or subsistence eater. Like this is one of their primary um, food sources, um, just because. Um, when we're looking and developing health health guidance, we are looking at kind of the um, vulnerable populations, kind of like we did with Gen X when developing our health our, our health level. We were looking at um, infants and um, pregnant women, um, and so again, kind of in the same method, um, same vein, we're looking at subsistence fishermen here. So we want to make sure that we're targeting those fish because um, if it's fish that are not being consumed by the public, then it's really not that useful of of a um, endeavor to go through. Um, but we do know that sometimes, I mean, you can't just go out on a waterway and know you're to get certain fish. Fish are not necessarily to agree with you all the time, not necessarily to be able to be caught. And so um, we do have leeway for suitable surrogate species to be used um, if, the, uh, if the desired species um, are not there. And so we want, and, and I have a note here that's from the same trophic level and because it's generally assumed that, again, it's not 100% accurate, but fish within the same trophic level it is um, thought that they will have similar bioaccumulation or similar levels as other species in that same trophic level. Um, and again, just for people's awareness, a trophic level um, is, um, if you think of the food chain, a trophic level is a certain um, step in that food chain. So if you kind of think of it as um, your top predators at the top of the food chain, that's one uh, one trophic level. And then you have the, um, so that would be like a largemouth bass. And then underneath them, they have smaller fish that they eat. That would be another trophic level. And then below uh, those smaller fish, it would be plants or insects. That's another trophic level. Just so um, 
I just wanted to clarify that in some case, some people were not necessarily uh, biologists or ecologists knowing what, what trophic levels were. Um, so again, we just want to make sure that we're collecting um, species at the same trophic level so that we're um, looking at comparing apples and apples. And again, um, kind of as I talked about earlier, is we just want to make sure that we're getting um, a minimum number of samples from a location um, and per trophic level. So again, um, just reiterating that's three fillet composite samples. Um, and again, um, that's from three to seven fish to make up that composite sample or five indiv individual fillet samples from, from different, um, from a specific species of fish. And so one thing too, is that fish from the same species are combined in a composite. You can't just take like a largemouth bass and a catfish and combine them into one to make a composite. We wanna make sure that we're getting species from all the, um, all the same fish into that composite samples. And, but um, again, another caveat to this is that um, m multiple species composites can be used to represent a single trophic level. So again, if you were to get, let's just say, largemouth bass there, um, you were able to catch enough to make a composite for largemouth bass, but then you had striped bass as another, you were able to connect, uh, catch a, a number of striped bass to be able to make another composite. You can use those two individual composites to be able to um, count towards your three composite samples um, to meet that minimum threshold there. Again, um, just don't want to mix species within the composites, but we can do that for trophic levels for those composite samples. Um, and then um, as far as sampling locations, um, the reason we bring this up is typically our fish consumption advisories are location specific or site specific. And so when we do this work, um, the Nova advisory um, is specific to that certain water body, but for example, um, we'll just take Lake Norman down uh, north of Charlotte there. It's a pretty huge lake. So um, <clears throat> we wanna make sure that um, for some locations, uh, you may wanna collect fish from different locations within the water body, just to make sure that, um, that what you're seeing is reasonably dispersed amongst that water body. So you're not just getting uh, a single cove um, within a lake or something like that. So multiple sample locations um, may be appropriate for larger water bodies there. And then also um, within um, DPH or um, DEQ, we may um, want to sample at specific locations because we know of suspected um, inflows or uh, uh, of different contaminants to the area, or they're just known as popular fishing locations within the area. So if there is a specific water body or um, area where basically we know there are a lot of fishermen either through um, talking with um, local stakeholders or um, a lot of times the Wildlife Resource Commission, um, they have a lot of uh, knowledge for all these different water bodies. If they know there's a specific area that people like to go to, uh, we may want to sample in those specific areas because we know that's where the majority of people are going to be doing their, their catch, their fishing. And so moving on um, past the um, sample collection here, uh, just wanted to kind of go through the analytical part here. And so uh, most often what we're looking for is EPA approved analytical um, Anal um, analytical methods um, to be used when people are doing this analysis within fish. Um, <clears throat> and so there, EPA does have a lot of different me methods developed and approved for use for measuring all these different contaminants in fish. And one thing um, we do um, do have and reserve the right for is that lab laboratory approval is at our discretion when we're doing this. And this is something that um, we bring up because Unfortunately, um, in some of our past past endeavors, um, I guess fish has been sampled at maybe not not approved labs or that don't have um, methods that can be readily verified. And so it's hard to tell what the validity of the data. And so <clears throat> we, we do try to go through and make sure that we're understanding how these processes are done. But in the in laboratory, the approval of the laboratory and what the um, the data that are um, providing is um, 
kind of at our discretion. Um, we do kind of make that determination. And just some of the, I kind of have two of the bullet points here, just kind of to highlight some of the reasons why um, just mentioning arsenic here is that we prefer that um, both inorganic and total arsenic are measured when looking at fish, um, just because of the difference in toxicity between inorganic and organic arsenic. And so it's important to make that distinction. So, um, that we're making sure our risk assessments reflect the actual toxicity that um, we're concerned about there. Uh, and then another one of the big ones that um, we definitely have uh, difficulties with sometime is looking at uh, PCBs. And so we do um, require the 209, uh, 209 congener data. And this is an EPA method for measuring all the different congeners of PCB. So these are all the distinct different PCBs because there are hundreds of PCBs out there that, um, so we require that they do this specific analysis in fish tissue data. Um, and, um, and this is important because there's another methodology called the error core um, PCB analysis is this is where you, kind of look at groups of PCBs um, and to get kind of an estimate of the concentrations there. And we don't use that data because it's you can very easily over or underestimate the risk depending on the, the analysis that's done there. And so it's not very um, specific there. And so, um, and also because of the differences in toxicity between all the different PCBs, um, that 209 congener data, it really helps us to um, go through and get the um, the, the actual um, risk there that's associated with that data. So again, um, this is just something, uh, just two of the examples of where this laboratory approval comes into play um, when people are submitting data to us. And so, once we get this data, uh, we'll do initial uh, evaluation to the, um, one to make sure kind of those thresholds in terms of um, sufficient information exists for us to do the risk assessment in terms of minimum samples being met. Um, also looking at the, the laboratory and methods here. Um, if additional data in, and so some in some of these cases, sometimes there's insufficient data needs or anything like that, we can still do a risk assessment on it. Is this it's not as strong and we we can do that still and we will do that just to help provide some information there but we it will be very heavily caveated that it basically doesn't meet our our uh, sampling thresholds there's error and uncertainty there because of course as you have um as you have less samples there your um the accuracy data and statistical power of that is decreased so um, we can still do it just to provide information, but again, it's not to be um, as strong or as, nor as accurate as we, we would like. Um, and then um, if the laboratory results of the uh, fish tissue concentrations uh, exceed the screening levels that I alluded to earlier, so those are the kind of the, minute, the floor at which we will do the work, um, um, we'll kind of go forward with it. But one thing I also wanted to point out here with the data review is that sometimes with labs, their reporting limits are above our screening levels. So just for um, a, an example would be, let's just say a lab can detect a contaminant at 10 ppb, but our screening level is one ppb for a specific contaminant. In that case, if they get a, a non-detect there, um, since that reporting limit is above our screening level, we will assume that that um, that there is actually five ppbs of that contaminant in in the fish. And again, that is um, because there's that gray area there where there the lab is not to report anything below that. But there is uh, we have determined that there's a health risk in kind of an area that's below that reporting limit. And so that's again. Um, erring on the side of caution to protect public health in these case cases. But again, that's um, kind of an important thing I want to bring up because this does happen actually fairly frequently where reporting limits from from labs do exceed the, the screening levels that that we develop. And so again, if the after reviewing this data, if the screening level for a chemical hasn't been exceeded, then where the 
I make the recommendation that a fish consumption advisory will not be issued because it's, again, if it's below that screening level, we suspect there's minimal risk um, involved with um, consuming that particular fish. If the fish, fish tissue data indicates an exceedance of the screening level, then we'll go through and do the risk assessment to calculate what are the actual meal limits that will be associated with this. And so um, sometimes um, it works out that um, when we do this calculation, if the meal limits are less than seven meals a week, um, then, we're, um, then we'll issue an advisory because there's a specific number of meals that can be um, could, uh, associated with that. But if the calculated meal limits are greater than seven days a week, then we're not to issue an advisory just because at that point um, you're, I guess if we're working on an assumption that people aren't eating more than one meal a day um, of the fish. But again, um, typically when we're working with um, fish advisories, um, that is the assumption that, um, that we're going there. So again, if it exceeds, if the meal limit exceeds seven meals per week, then we're not to issue an advisory in that case. Um, but um, regardless of the, the outcome in the end, um, a recommendation will be prepared um, and that um, preparation includes a write up um, going through the data, kind of a summary of the data and what we did. Um, the conclusions that we make, the recommendations um, and also any caveats that we may have, have with the data and it will also contain the, the calculations and um, kind of the outcomes themselves. So people, um, stakeholders or the public that, are, um, that get the um, that have the actual report can go through and kind of see why we're making the recommendations and how the actual calculations, how they fell and what, why we were making these recommendations. So, uh, the last part is after we make um, the decision to go, go forward with fish consumption advisory, um, then uh, we will work on starting the communication process. So, um, We'll reach out to impacted stakeholders, so that's local health departments, community groups, DEQ, uh, Wildlife Resource Commission, um, to, to let them know that the fish com consumption advisory is coming and also what that advisory entails. Um, if there is no, no advisory that's coming, then we also still communicate that to um, whoever made the initial request and other stakeholders. Um, so again, Typically, that's the EQ, local health departments and requesting party, but it doesn't go through um, the whole process with working with um, department communications and PIOs because we're not um, really to issue a press release that nothing's happening. Um, and so we'll make sure that the people that were involved in the process or um, are notified, but it doesn't have that little extra step in terms of um, going through the department communications area. And then one of the other parts of this too is once we uh, communicate the um, communicate the advisory and that the advisory is coming out, we do um, to suggest recommend that some of these other um, actions take place. So, um, so this is one all takes place all the time, but posting the advisory to um, the DPH fish advisory webpage. So this um, we do have a web page um, that has all of our fish advisories um, that are applicable in the state. Um, so that Every fish advisory gets posted there. Um, we do recommend that um, there's posting of fish advisory signs on the waterway. Um, and this is something that we definitely hear a lot from from community groups. Um, it's that the posting of signs on the waterway um, really falls um, to the local jurisdiction of whoever has jurisdiction over that water body um, there. So that um, oftentimes is either county health departments or sometimes as a parks and park and recreation division, some other jurisdiction there, but um, is the ones that um, ultimately are the ones responsible for posting these fish advisory signs. But um, to that end, we don't um, leave them up to their own devices. Um, we are always there to help provide um, assistance in developing the signs um, for those folks. It's just more getting them out there um, and posting them is really um, is at the uh, local level. Um, and there, we definitely have history of working. I know um, 
most recently worked with New Hanover County to help develop uh, fish advisory signs for them um, a couple of years ago for some of the issues they were dealing with. Um, but also public service announcement. And so this is where um, working with the department communications to help kind of get that message out that a new fish advisory has been developed and for a waterway. So that's um, where that comes in. Uh, kind of ties in with press releases at local newspapers. So uh, for definitely some of the areas we've also, um, our communication teams have worked with uh, local uh, media organi organizations to help uh, make sure the word gets out to those local areas because not everybody is looking on the um, our websites to check for this stuff. So uh, local newspaper um, or other media sources there, um, county webpage, it's kind of same vein. Um, and then um, one of the last things um, is that notification through the North Carolina Wild, uh, Wildlife Resource Commission, their publications and websites. Um, the, we do work um, really closely with the Wildlife Resource um, Commission um, to kind of get these advisors out because uh, local fishermen, um, especially ones that go through the process of getting the license and going through all this, um, the Wildlife Resource Source Commission does provide them with documents and publications that have all of our fish advisories um, in there and the one specifically applicable to the water body they're in is typically highlighted. And so, um, again, I just want to highlight that we do work with them and that these materials are, um, they're tried to, we try to disseminate them as best we can amongst the public. And so that's an overview of our whole process right there. And that, again, um, <clears throat> uh, some some of the other details going through weeds that can help answer questions if people have that. That's kind of a high, um, high overview thing. And so kind of to wrap it all up, I kind of wanted to bring it back to PFAS and FISH because we know this has been something that's been brought up at past SAB meetings. And we just kind of wanted to uh, highlight how this kind of ties in here. So we have been um, looking at other um, other states, what um, they have been doing with pea passion fish, so uh, mentioned here, Alabama, Michigan, Minnesota, New Jersey, Wisconsin, and they have developed, um, they call it triggers in their documentation where they, um, they don't necessarily go through the whole process that we do in terms of um, developing specific meal advisories, but they have the, their triggers where they put on advisories for not eating or limited uh, consumption of fish um, based upon the data that they get for their specific sites. Um, and that there are also advisories um, that relate to specific PFAS and those um, vary from state to state um, depending upon which uh, PFASs they are dealing with um, specifically in their area. Um, <clears throat> And so uh, I will say a lot of them are um, specifically related to PFOS, um, so that's PFOS, um, just because there has been um, a lot more data showing that that is one, the PFAS that bioaccumulates more readily in fish than um, compared to PFOA and some of the other um, PFAS, um, what is it, PFNA, P PFBA, some of the other ones that are are out there, this PFOS seems to be the one that um, is detected um, at elevated concentrations more, more often than some of the other PFAS. Um, and then one of the last things I kind of wanted to bring back, um, this bring up related to PFAS and fish is just, um, as we're all really aware, there are unfortunately um, dozens um, of PFAS uh, chemicals that are out there that we are aware of. And unfortunately, this is kind of a similar vein that we have with, um, with drinking water and some of the other PFAS is that we can only develop advisories for PFAS for which we have toxicological values for. And so what I mean by that is uh, reference doses or cancer slope factors um, for specific PFAS. Um, we can't develop advisories for PFAS that we don't have these values for just because we, we don't, um, we just, um, again, like drinking water, we just, um, wouldn't be able to quantify what that um, actual uh, concentration meant. So again, I just kind of wanted to um, bring that back just because I know we can detect a lot of them, but we don't necessarily have the, the means to uh, quantify or um, develop recommendations for what that um, actually means. Um, and so uh, again, I just want to put our contact information up here at the end, and I'm more than happy to um, answer any questions. I've been seeing it flash up on the chat here on the side here, um, but 
but uh, and I'll see if I can pull um, up the things here, but I'm more happy to answer any questions um, that people may have. Thank you, Kennedy. This is Tom. I'll start by suggesting that uh, if board members have questions, <clears throat> we get to those first. We've got 15 minutes before the break, and uh, <clears throat> then we can look at some in the chat. I had one, which is the what's the source of the screening values? And I take it, you know, from your second to the last slide that you can only derive a advisory when you've got a screening level. But does the state have the ability to derive screening values if the toxicological data exists to support them? Or, or is, is there a difference given or a, does it have to be from EPA or some or FDA or some other body? No, so we we developed this screening levels here at uh, DHHS and OEEB. So if we have a reference dose or cancer slope factor, because we do look at both non uh, non -carcin, uh, carcinogens and carcinogenic endpoints, um, if they're if they're applicable, um, and we will go through and develop those. Um, not saying the process is one for one like drinking water, um, but kind of similar to um, the GenX uh, drinking water. Um, health goal that we developed, we'll kind of go through that process and kind of, um, as I kind of alluded to with the meal, meal limits, um, we'll go through the screening levels are set um, to the point where we would not, ex there'd be minimal health risk um, if they were below that. So they, they are um, conservative when we go through that. But again, it's it depends on what data we have um, and uh, what, what values we're dealing with and how we go through that process. But. So a key there for any emerging contaminant is the process exists where if you have the analytical chemistry and you've got the process for number of meals and things like that, but you have to have uh, a mammalian toxicology value to plug in to determine a screening level and that's at y'all's discretion. That is correct. Um, but um, but even, even in the absence of a screening value, if we didn't have one specifically developed for a contaminant yet. We could still go through the process if we, again, if we had that toxicological data to go through, if we had uh, tissue data, we could go through and do the, the meal calculations, um, even if we didn't have a screening va uh, level value. The screening level value is more of a um, a tool if, if we have developed for, let's just say, a, a known contaminant that we've dealt with in the past, like I'll just say mercury, um, just because it's well known with fish and everything. Um, but um, we could go through that process. So this kind of helps, uh, I guess, in terms of the workload, if we know it's below a certain threshold, um, that we don't have to go through the whole process, just because some of the calculations and the going through all that can this be a, a long process, but we don't necessarily need a screening level value. We can do the work without one if that was the case. Questions from uh, board members or uh, the agency staff we serve uh, first, and then we'll move on. Um, this is John Vandenberg Kennedy. Thank you very much for a very nice overview. I, could you give me some or give us some idea about the number of fish advisories that the state has had in the state in the last year and, and what particular contaminants were most prominent that caused those fish advisories yeah so over the last year um there was one new advisory that was issued and that was um in new hanover and brunswick counties um and that was actually using data collected um, through Duke University, looking at uh, heavy metals um, in parts um, parts of the lower Cape Fear and also some of the tributaries that feed into it um, um, down there kind of where it runs along the Brunswick and New Hanover uh, County lines. Um, and those were looking at, uh, again, heavy metals, but specifically hexavalent chromium, chromium, arsenic, uh, mercury, um, some of those things. And so there was uh, an advisory developed for uh, some of the species down there um, and also blue crab um, in that area. Um, otherwise, um, I'm trying to think of other off the top of my head. Um, I think there's typically maybe one, I'm averaging here, one new advisory issue a year, um, but there are um, in North Carolina, there's a standing uh, advisory for all North Carolina body, bodies related to mercury, um, just because the historical data is there to 
unfortunately, mercury impacts pretty much all of our water bodies across the state. And so there's a standing virus advisory for several fish in those areas, um, in those water bodies. But then I think off the top of my head, there's probably somewhere between 20 and 30 standing advisories for specific water bodies and specific contaminants, such as um, PCBs, um, PAHs, dioxins, other heavy metals, um, such as arsenic, um, like I mentioned. Um, but those are the ones that are there for um, currently. Okay, thank you. Are there um, evaluations for the microsystems for you know, algal blooms, things like that as well? Uh, <clears throat> there's currently not. We do in North Carolina, um, we do look at water bodies. If there is an algal bloom, we will sample the water um, itself for microcystins, um, especially if the species are identified that could potentially be toxin um, toxin producing. But as far as sampling fish for algal toxins, that work is not currently done um, right now in the state. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the question, John, and the responses, Kennedy, and to Virginia as well, who's working behind the scenes to provide the link to where the advisories are and add some context. Uh, other questions from the board or staff that the board serves? Dr. Augsburger, this is Shishma Meesmore. Um, one note I wanted to make is, as Kennedy mentioned, um, the fish advisory work uh, has been used by other states for, for doing multiple things. Um, we're looking into um, how DEQ can also utilize uh, some of those efforts to answer the unknown questions that we have related to PFAS um, in, in the fish tissue. And as Dr. Nielsen talks about later, uh, we'll try to connect the dots um, in this conversation as well in future conversations. Thank you. Thank you for that context. Anyone else, anyone else on the board? This is Statlef, if, if I may. Sure. Um, yeah, thank you for the presentation. I'm curious I, I if i understood correctly towards the beginning you mentioned the need for approved methods um and to the best of my knowledge uh you know the epa 1633 method is still in draft form so i'm i'm curious whether i understood it correctly first and second if if yes um how would you go about this uh, need for an approved method? Yeah, um, so I'll say um, maybe I wasn't clear. Um, so in terms of EPA approved method, that is typically what we we like to, I guess, like to see for like a better way of putting it um, or like to use just because, again, it's gone through the um, kind of vigorous process there to EPA. But um, more specifically, again, I'll relate this back to PFAS because I know that's um, kind of what's going on here. We know that the um, EPA doesn't have an approved method and that um, method is going through the works right now, like he says, in draft form. And I know it's supposed to be coming out um, or supposedly coming out um, this summer, I think, is what I've heard target date um, through various communications um, that can, um, can be used for this work. But um, in the absence of that currently, that's again, where we, um, if let's say there was a lab or somebody was able to provide us with fish tissue data that let's say was able to measure PFAS in fish um, in the air, in the lower Cape Fear, if we were able to get that data, we would go through the process of trying to understand what that methodolo methodology was um, looking at other states, because other states such as like I kind of the ones I um, highlighted here in the example, they they have been doing this work in, without a EPA approved method. And so kind of seeing is that method something similar to it that they have used um, or is this what they have used um, to go through and do their work. So we would go um, kind of using the EPA methods kind of eliminates that that step in the process just because we know that's 
what's going on behind the scenes there. But if we were to get data that's not using one of those, we would go through and work to try to see, can we use this data? What's going on here? So there, again, maybe I wasn't clear earlier, but we definitely um, would make the effort to poten potentially be able to use that data if it was made available to us um, in that case. Yeah, so I'm, I'm asking in part, and maybe I'm jumping the gun, but Amy Delinsky published a very nice paper in, I forget, 2007, eight or nine, somewhere in that time frame, uh, where she specifically looked at PFAS levels in fish in the Haw River. So, you know, we do have some data already, even for an upstream location that shows elevated PFAS levels in in fish in in that watershed uh well again without jumping on here this is definitely um something uh we can look into um and see what can be um what can be gleaned from that from that information yeah. thank you thank you detlef and kennedy uh i'm gonna move us on just a bit um to uh, revisit the idea of at least asking, and it's optional if Beth Marcosino is on the phone and wants to address her public forum, forum comments to the board now. Um, in the virtual setting, we've asked people to sign up and to tell us what their topic was. And uh, this, this Marcosino's topic was, um, was this one. And so one option would be to hear those comments now closer to when uh, they relate to the topic than at the end of the day, but either will work. So I'm gonna pause and see uh, as an option if Beth would like to make her comments now before the break. Hey, this is Peter, the, the WebEx host. Um, I don't see Beth in the attendee list, but there are two call-in users. There's a call-in user three and a call-in user four. I don't know what their names are. So if either of you three or four are Beth, if you could please press star three on your phone, that would raise your hand so I could know to call on you. And, and again, it's optional. It is changing up the agenda a little bit. Um, okay. but it doesn't have to be a change. So let's pause for a minute. And if Beth was interested in commenting to. Check my email and make sure we're not hearing from her that way. Apparently Beth was having trouble getting on the meeting. And neither of those call in users have raised their hand. All right, we can revisit it at the end. That's okay. the appropriate, that was the appropriate time for it. It was just this an, an option that I raised. There are a couple of questions in the chat that came to panelists that have to do uh, with things like what are the sources of pollutants that triggered particular advisories and plans for future advisories. Uh, I'm going to suggest in the interest of time, since we're getting close to the identified break, that those go directly to um, either Kennedy, whose contact information is here, or or sources. You know, it may be good to contact the regional office of DEQ that will have knowledge about uh, particular source or sources in those areas. Some of these compounds are, in fact, ubiquitous. Um, but I will uh, close this out by asking Kennedy, you know, is there a couple of the questions have to do with like, are there plans for advisories for particular pollutants in certain areas? Generically, is there anything that's on the work list right now? Topics that are in the hopper? Um, I mean, I will say um, just to address that in terms of pollutants, again, it's kind of why I brought you up as the last slide, definitely. We at the state, and this is DHHS, DEQ, Marine Fisheries. Basically, uh, we're all looking at getting, trying to develop and do some of this work for PFAS and fish, um, just because we do know we have heard community members um, throughout the state being concerned about this. So we are 
definitely trying to figure out a way to do some of this work and we're coordinating between basically all of us to try to um, figure out how the best to do this. Um, and to kind of tie into it, I will answer this question here because it kind of fits into the whole, the overview of everything by, there was a question in, in the chat that was about how the spatial component of an advisory is developed. And I know this is something that we um, part, again, this part of the conversations uh, relating to the lower Cape Fear because I mean, it's a large river, hundreds of miles there. Um, and so if you were to sample, let's just say up near Fayetteville um, and get fish data there, that's not necessarily to inform you of what's happening down in Wilmington. And so that is in terms of developing this spatial component of advisory, um, we are working with our, um, our ecologists and kind of our fish experts to kind of determine ranges and kind of see um, what type of sampling points, how much sampling would need to be done in order to uh, develop a more comprehensive picture of some of these larger water bodies, in this case, Cape Fear River, um, I'm using this example. Um, but we are working to kind of understand what is a scientifically appropriate way to kind of um, develop advisories for some of these larger wa water bodies, take into account basically some of the things you were bringing up, like the mobility of these fish, because if they're in a river, they're not, unless there's a dam or impediment there, they can basically go up and down that river as they please. So we're just, we're, we are working on that to make sure that we're doing things accurately and it would be reflective of what is going on out there. Um, Anything so I, currently in the work plan related to uh, metals? <clears throat> Still a question. Uh, uh, yeah, so with metals, um, I know um, there's been, um, ongoing sampling up in the Dan River area related to the coal ash spill that was ha happening up there, the heavy metals that potentially could be associated with coal ash. And I know there has been sampling also um, down, um, down and around uh, the Lake Sutton area in New Hanover County um, because of concerns related to uh, coal ash impoundments um, being flooded there and a path couple of the past hurricane events that we've had. Um, <clears throat> I don't know specifically in terms of future sampling, um, specifically for Lake Sutton. I know the Dan River stuff is kind of a routine monitoring um, program that's going on there. But um, typically when it comes to heavy metals, um, there's a kind of like the Lake Sutton are more uh, a lot of response driven. So if we're seeing um, the metals or seeing the events there that that's when the, uh, the work usually occurs and that's what's happened with the lake sutton area um and working with new hanover county to kind of help get some of that information out there to the, the public in that area thanks kennedy i think that's responsive to the only questions that i see in the chat and we are just past the time for break thanks again for your presentation thanks everybody for your participation this morning we will resume at 12 30. Thanks everybody. See you then. If you're gonna hang on the line, I'd suggest you put your phone on mute or just rejoin at 1230. All right, recording has started again. Thank you, I appreciate it. Uh, they both represent the continuing evolution of the state's approach to working with others to respond to and manage the many uh, PFAS in the environment uh, with regard to protecting the environmental and human health. If you think back, you know, to uh, last summer uh, with a series of, of um, tables that were shared back and forth from Dr. Franny Nielsen to the board. There's been uh, a continual mining of the available exposure data and mining of the effects data to see where there are potential matches for high priority compounds in North Carolina. And as we've heard from uh, Assistant Secretary Macemore a few times, a deep cognizance and working relationship with other state agencies and federal agencies uh, with regard to other work that's going on so that North Carolina can benefit from that and potentially 
the value added as opposed to duplicative. Uh, the next presentation continues that uh, data mining work and uh, focusing and targeting. It'll be given by Dr. Amy Delinsky with uh, DEQ's Division of Waste Management, who's going to present to us on PFAS signatures in multimedia for the Lower Cape Fear area. Uh, we'll have time for questions at the end. Um, if you have a question that you want to pose in the chat so that you don't forget about it, please take advantage of that as well. So thank you for joining us, uh, Dr. Delinsky. Hearing me? I can see the slides well. I can't hear you very well, but maybe I turned my sound down. Let me try it again. No, my sound's pretty high. Okay. Um, can you that's hear much, me now? That's much better. Thank you. Okay. All right. Okay. So thank you for having me here today. Um, I am going to present a deeper dive into um, PFAS signatures. And um, the reason for this is a lot of times we have um, reports that are given to us by Comores that um, base decisions and hypotheses on these PFAS signatures. So the slides um, that I'm gonna show you are meant to be a, a reference and a reference that's visual in nature so that trends that are present with um, regards to which PFAS are prevalent throughout the Cape Fear River Basin are, are more readily ob observed. Okay, so a few uh, notes about the data that um, I want to mention before we get started. Um, the data that is going to be presented, some of it is from DEQ and other is from, from Comores. Um, each slide will indicate the source of that data. J qualifiers um, are flags that are added to data that have uncertainty associated with them. And those J flags were removed for the purposes of being able to graph the, the numerical data. And that was necessary, necessary in particular for several um, data sets where almost all of the, the data was J flagged. Um, some analytes, particularly NAFI and byproducts 4, 5, and RE, are likely overreported, so I just want to go ahead and be straightforward about that um, and transparent about that. Um, and they may be overreported two to ten times high due to analytical issues. Um, e and each graph that I'm going to show is a snapshot in time. Just want to make sure to state that up front too, because water bodies, particularly rivers, can change. So before I get started um, into the in, into explaining all the different um, PFAS that are present, I just want to mention that each bar that you see is going to represent one sample, um, and each color within that bar is one PFAS. And the way that these are arranged, I have the Comores PFAS generally going from order of most abundant to least abundant, and then starting in with the most abundant legacy PFAS going to the least abundant legacy PFAS. Um, and in addition, each PFAS that has its unique color maintains that same color throughout this presentation. So from one slide to the next, when you see, for example, this blue, that is PFMOAA and will be PFMOAA in all subsequent slides. Um, I do want to mention that the, um, the first six compounds that you see that happen to be here on this first row are the six most abundant Comores specific compounds. And I'm going to just briefly go through each of them because we'll see them again and again. So I've already mentioned PFMOAA in blue. PFO2HXA is in gold. This light blue is PMPA. Gen X is orange. 
PFO3OA is this darker blue, and then in red is PEPA. Um, so if you look at this slide, it, um, I will also mention for this particular sample, the way that it works out, we've got the first three rows are Comores compounds, and then the last two rows are legacy compounds. And for this particular sample, um, this sample was collected near the Husk Dam. It was collected directly from the boat ramp, just a scoop um, of getting some surface water. DQ, DEQ collected this sample. And what we saw is in this sample that was at this location that is uh, heavily impacted by Comores compounds uh, due to contaminated groundwater, particularly from seeps and particularly really from one seep called the, the lock and dam seep that is not treated by a GAC system before it discharges in, into the river very close to the boat ramp. So this signature is heavily impacted by Comores um, process or Comores contaminated groundwater. And what we see is over half of the total PFAS in this particular sample is PFMOAA. Um, and the total table three or Comores related PFAS make up over 85% of the sample. Um, PPF acid or PFPRA, which is a three carbon legacy PFAS that is one carbon shorter than PFBA, makes up over 10% of the sample. And then the rest of the legacy PFAS really don't make up all that much of, of the, the total PFAS in this particular sample. So for each slide, I'm also going to have the total PFAS number. So um, it, this sample that was very close to contaminated groundwater source had um, over 6,800 total PFAS. Um, and everything is going to be reported in nanograms per liter or parts per billion. And what that means is PFMOAA at over 50% would be over 3,400 um, nanograms per liter. So having this total number is meant for PFAS is meant to give you an idea of how these compounds um, break down. Um, the next slide gives um, the PFAS signature farther downstream. And right away, you notice it looks different. PFMOAA is a much sh a smaller contributor to this um, particular sample. This sample was taken at River Mile 116, but the, sa the samples from River Mile 100, 116, and 149 had I nearly identical PFAS signatures. And this represents samples that are yeah, 25 to 70 miles downstream, similar signatures, the concentration didn't vary too much either between these samples. So total PFAS here is 218 nanograms per liter. Um, when we look at the downstream samples, we have um, much more of a almost 50-50 mix between Comores and legacy PFAS. And you know that can vary generally for most samples, plus or minus 10%. So you have like 40 to 60% Comores PFAS in, in a given downstream um, sample that's surface water sample that, that's collected. I do want to bring up, um, so these, these six compounds here are the six that contributed, they're the six main P, Comores PFAS that contribute to the signature. I did want to bring up some additional compounds here. So this is the last slide we're going to see PPF acid on and a few other brightly colored compounds that I have that I have brightly colored are RE, we have Nathium byproduct four and Nathium byproduct five. So again, Nathium byproduct four and five I mentioned and also RE are overreported likely two to 10 times. I just wanted to at least show that they do contribute to the total, even if they, they, they are overreported in this particular, um, in, in currently due to analytical limitations. And PPF acid, I think the, the analytical results are much better for that compound, but it's an early eluder and still has some analytical issues. I just wanted to show 
um, a little bit of data for this compound and the others, because DEQ doesn't normally look for these four compounds. Um, but they do contribute to the total. So as far as the legacy PFAS, in addition to this PPF acid or PFPRA, just as an introduction, we have PFOS in gray. Then in this light green here, we have PFOA, and then PFPEA, PFHXA, PFBA, PFHXS, PFBS, and PFHPA. And we'll see a lot of these same legacy PFAS. Again, the yellow is going to not show up anymore because we don't look for it usually. But we'll see a lot of these other legacy PFAS in subsequent slides. Okay, so here is our first um, slide that has multiple samples. So all of these slides are going to have upstream locations at the top working downstream. And these again are surface water samples. These samples are collected by, uh, well, in 2020 by Comores contractors. And if we look at these, we see some, some different, um, several different things to notice. So PMPA is found upstream as far as over 50 miles away from Comores. Um, NVHOS and Napian byproduct four also show up. So Comores does look at some of at the Napian byproducts, but they also over report them. But the data is here to show the presence. The rest of the compounds are quantitated accurately. So PMPA shows up and that would be at about 30% or a little over 30% of the total PFAS, which are shown now vertically on the right. Um, are Comores PFAS upstream of, of the facility. The rest are those same legacy PFAS that we had seen in the previous slide. So just briefly, PFHXA, um, PFOS, PFPEA, um, PFOA. Um, then adjacent to the Comores facility, River Mile 76 is, um, is right on the northern boundary of the facility and shows more of a PFAS signature of the upstream locations. River Mile 77 is also adjacent to the facility, but farther down um, downstream a little bit by one mile and starts to pick up some of the additional Comores PFAS, PFO. 2 HXA um, and Gen X, but mostly has legacy PFAS present there. Um, downstream, we see again PMPA shows up a lot, and then we start to pick up more Comores compounds, such that um, whereas site adjacent there was you know 25 percent or less Comores compounds, now we've got about 50 percent to 60% Comores compounds downstream. Um, one item to note is that PMPA and PEPA had higher, higher reporting limits. And this is likely why we did not see PMPA in a couple of, of these samples. Um, and so the next slide shows that on a different day in 2020, um, sampling some of these similar locations PMPA was seen consistently across both the um, River Mile 76 that was site adjacent on the northern boundary of the Comores facility and in all of the downstream samples. Um, Tar Heel is, is seven miles downstream. Um, Kings Bluff is 55 miles downstream. And again, you've got, let's see in this case, 60 or a little over 60% of the total PFAS shown here on the right are Comores compounds, similar legacy compound signature. Taking a closer look at the facility itself and very close proximity um, surface water bodies, we see some different signatures um, depending on whether you're on site or you're off-site, so, and that mainly is due to um, whether you're looking at contaminated groundwater or if you're looking at surface water. So um, on-site PFMOAA shows up in these seeps, which is contaminated groundwater that, um, that discharges to the Cape Fear River. 
and you've got high concentrations of total PFAS. Much lower concentrations of total PFAS in the outfalls that are more affected by process wastewater and stormwater. On the other hand, to the north and the south, you've got Willis Creek and you've got Georgia Branch Creek. Um, and you have much lower PFMOAA contribution to the total, more PMPA contribution to the total, and, and also more Gen X contribution. And Willis Creek has more PFMOAA than Georgia Branch Creek. DEQ collected some samples for a GAC and RO study that was um, that looks at groundwater contaminated groundwater um, at residents near the Comoros facility. These residents have been offered GAC or RO systems and um, the contamination is thought to be due to aerial deposition followed by subsequent rainfall. Some of the PFAS may still be bound up in the soil, but those PFAS that do make it down to the groundwater are shown here and PMPA is predominant followed by Gen X and some of the other compounds that we have been seeing in, in previous slides related to Comores, they make up over 95% of the total. We did have one GAC um, eligible resident that decided to get um, an RO system. And one thing that's interesting to note between the GAC um, and the, all of the GAC eligible sites had this PFO3OA and the, the RO eligible sites did not. But again, similar PFAS composition here. I do wanna point this out um, because the next slide is gonna be New Hanover County private wells, and you'll see the signature is different. So in New Hanover County in the lower Cape Fear, we see PFMOAA again is, is predominant, and then PFO2HXA is close after that, and to a lesser extent, PFO3OA. Uh, PMPA and, and Gen X that had taken more, um, had, had contributed more to the PFAS signature closer to the facility is not as big of a contributor. And then there's some legacy PFAS. Looking at the non-private wells, it really depends on which wells you look at. If I looked at the first 14, there was a mixed um, bag of signatures where you had a couple of, of um, areas where you had the Comores signature, and then others had more of the legacy PFAS. Some wells had more of the legacy PFAS predominant signature. And then there were a number of wells that had um, Comores compounds predominant. And when I plotted those, there were similar um, signatures among them with PFMOAA and PFO2HXA being the main two Comores compounds present. So going back to the facility, um, I wanted to take a little look, another look by aquifer at the PFAS signatures. So the perch zone is the one that's closest to the surface right underneath the facility and is mostly um, PFMOAA predominant, except in the Napian area where Napian is produced, these pinks and greens show a lot of Napian byproducts that show up. Um, also, Gen X is, is showing up in some of the, the Napian areas and other areas along the facility. These actually, these PFMOAA areas here are in a different area, more south in the, in the facility. The surficial aquifer um, has also a mixed bag of which PFAS is predominant. Sometimes it's Gen X, sometimes it's PMPA. Sometimes it's PFMOAA, but again, the same six main PFAS that we see related to Comores. The Black Creek Aquifer has a little bit more of the PFMOAA predominant um, in, in that aquifer, a little bit deeper down. But again, the same um, compounds show up. Looking at uh, 2019 Comores Process Wastewater, we don't have very much data on the Comores Process Wastewater, but the data that we do have shows that the polymer processing area has got um, heavily contaminated um, PFAS wastewater that is mostly Gen X. And the I Monitor's IXM area also has Gen X 
and in addition has got Napian byproducts um, four and five, and then some of the other PFAS that we've seen um, in the other PFAS signatures from other water sources. So I zoomed in on these areas where Gen X was really predominant and what shows up in the remainder and in the total PFAS that remains is PFMOAA, uh, uh, PFOA, and then this in this uh, dark green is PFHXS and monomers IXM has, has that different signature with the Nathian byproducts. So um, McCord and Striner showed that repeated samples taken in 2017 when Comores ceased to discharge into the Cape Fear River um, had a pretty sharp decrease in PFAS ion abundance. So at this time, there weren't, wasn't really concentration data. So it's just what, sig what kind of signal you got in the instrument when you injected. And over time, you could compare and see that was decreasing. More so for um, the polyether acids, PFO2HXA and PFO3OA, than for the monoether acids, PMPA, PEPA, and Gen X. And I've got the amount that they decreased here. Um, and ion abundance data from Mark Streiner's paper showed that in the 2012 samples, um, the top six Comores compounds that were present in the Cape Fear River were still the same six compounds. So that's a little bit of data. We don't have much from earlier than 2017, but that's one bit of information we have from earlier than um, 2017. And more of that earlier information would, would be helpful to, to have a better idea of what was going on in the river, particularly when trying to assess what is happening downstream in Wilmington and with some of the um, contamination of, of the groundwater there. So one point I did want to make about PFMOAA and why it might be more predominant is that PFMOAA is present in two different homologous series of compounds. It is in common both to the polyether and to the monoether compounds. And what that means is for P with PFMOAA, if you add an OCF2 and another carbon, you get PFO2HXA. Uh, you add another carbon, another OCF2, you get PFO3OA. For, similarly, with PFMOA, if you add just a CF2, you get PMPA. Add another CF2, you get PEPA. And yet one more CF2, you get Gen X. And this might also be reflected in the um, amount of decrease of these compounds in the river. So um, PFO2HXA and PFO3A they decrease over 100 times, like averaging 130 times, but PFMOAA decreases only 77 fold, maybe because it's also in this homologous series with PMPA, PEPA, and Gen X that do not decrease as much. They have a decrease and then subsequent increase. And that is the end of the information that I have today. Again, this was meant to provide a visual reference and uh, introduction into PFAS signatures, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Amy. It was a good visual representation. Um, thanks for walking us through the orientation early on with regard to what the stacked horizontal bars meant and the colors. I think I got most of it and the ability to look at the total concentration time at the percentage and have a rough idea of of how much was there. Uh, I'll open it to questions from board members uh, first. This is Detlef. Go ahead, Detlef, thanks. Thank you for the presentation, Amy. Um, one thing that really stuck out to me was high PMPA levels up to, I think you said, 50 miles upstream. Um, it seems to me that wouldn't be just direct input from the air. So is it, 
is it likely that groundwater is contaminated up to 50 miles away from air deposition over the decades and groundwater is recharging to the river? That is a question, good question that I don't know the answer to. Um, and of course, more information would be helpful. Um, it could be a combination. I'm just, I'm not sure. Um, but what I will say is we had one sample that was taken recently over, it was about 20 miles away and it was over um, 100 nanograms per liter of PMPA. So as we, our Comores is sampling farther and farther out, trying to find the edge of contamination and sometimes we sample it as well. We haven't found that edge of contamination and we're at 20 miles and, and, and still going, but still PMPA is the compound most commonly found and it was recently found over 100 um, nanograms per liter. Um, as far as the contaminated groundwater, I would really need to consult with some of the hydrogeologists to, to get a, a better idea, um, but more work would, would be helpful to better understand that. Yeah, it would inform, you know, how far to really look and also it may be in directions that differ from the prevailing southwest to northeast, uh, so prevailing wind air corridor, you know, it seems like the, and these are river, Cape Fear River samples, which, yes. you know, is going more straight north that's yeah. right thank you yeah thank, thank you, you Detlef and amy uh any more questions from the board this is jamie i have a, a comment and a question all right jamie thanks so amy thank you so much these were really well presented and very easy for a non-chemist to understand but when I look at these, I always think from a toxicological perspective about how I can best model or how other toxicologists can best model what you're observing in the river and to what people might be exposed to. So in, in looking at the different concentrations, do you, and, and I'm asking you for a little bit of a toxicological opinion, and I understand if you can't give one, obviously mixtures are really important. If we're trying to design a mixture, should we use compounds that are in greatest abundance or compounds that are detected in highest frequency or maybe a mixture or two? Have you had any conversations about what you'd like to see from a mixtures design study? We have had some ongoing discussions about that and, um, and we're still working on our experimental design. I'll say that I, I do appreciate the paper that you had with PFMO AA and Nafian byproduct two is a mixture and Nafian byproduct two, even though I didn't emphasize that in this presentation, it's like a close number seven behind a lot of the other compounds. So it's one that's out there as well. And it is one that's accurately measured unlike Nafian byproducts four and five. So I think both are important. Overall is what I would say the abundance PFMOAA is in high abundance. It's a smaller chain compound, not necessarily thought to be, you know, have as many toxic effects, but then you have that paper with Nafian bar product two and PFMOAA and the two together can have more of an effect. So I think both are important and, it, and should be considered and more conversations are to be had. Yes, thank you. Uh, you know, I'm really also surprised at the total PFAS concentrations and and how far above any sort of advisory anywhere um, those those are. So thanks again for your presentation. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. It's a good point, Jamie, and keep in mind also the table that um, Dr. Nielsen put together and presented to us a couple of times over the summer with. Uh, updates based on information requested from the board, which also had um, compounds present in in people. Uh, might be another 
media to explore for the mixtures in terms of designing exposure studies, that which people are accumulating. I'll entertain one more question, and then I think we need to scooch it along. Um, but I'll give you a heads up that we had Dana Sargent and Gary uh, Gupton uh, were two that had requested to speak at the public forum on this topic. And I, as I did with the last one, we'll pause and see if they'd like to make their comments now contemporaneous with the topic or wait to the end. But let's have one more question from the board if there is one before I call for uh, public forum comments on this topic. All right. Thank you again, Amy. Much appreciated. Good job. Uh, we did have, you know, time on the end of the day for the public forum. That's when it's scheduled. It's not a problem if folks prefer to address their comments then. But uh, we did ask folks to sign up for what it was they were keen to talk about. And Dana Sargent and um, Gary Gupton, I hope I'm saying that right, had signed up to address this topic. So I'll see if they're available and want to, to sp spend a couple of minutes talking about their comments now. So how about Dana first? You could either put something in the chat or if you're able to be heard. Dana, you are unmuted and you can speak now. Thanks very much. Can you hear me? I can. Do you prefer to talk now or at the end? I didn't want to surprise people, but I thought it might be helpful to tie their topic to the to the presentation. I think that's great and I'm happy to comment now and I appreciate the opportunity. As with all these meetings, I don't prepare ahead of the time because I just want to wait and see what's spoken. Um, so I do have a a couple questions really, rather than comments today. Um, for the, the final presenter, Dr. Delinsky, I appreciate your presentation. I do have a question on how you defined legacy and I apologize, I missed the first few seconds of your presentation. I'm not certain if you did define it, but we have seen recent research um, from some of our, our own you know, North Carolina scientists showing that some of these compounds that may be coming out of the facility are morphing into what we're calling legacy compounds. So I'm just a little bit concerned about removing Chemorda's liability with, with that and also knowing that, you know, PFOA, for instance, is obviously a legacy compound, but it came from that facility. You know, we know that DuPont was releasing PFOA as, you know, part of their manufacturing of that without any uh, permit. Um, so that's my first question. My second question is to DEQ, um, to leadership, maybe um, Assistant Secretary Maysmore. Um, we know that Chemors has filed a request for a correction of the science in EPA's uh, recent Gen X tox assessment. And I'm, you know, I'm guessing that will inevitably slow down EPA's um, supposed forthcoming um, submission of a revised or of an advisory goal for Gen X. Is DEQ prepared to act in advance of EPA or is DEQ going to wait for EPA? on that considering this, this action by Chem Wars to clearly delay that process. Um, and then my comment would be just um, to, to, to the folks on the, the committee, again, I appreciate all of your expertise and guidance. And I do hope that um, the folks here you know, suggest to DEQ um, that the science is clear on technology-based limits uh, relative to their recent draft permit on groundwater we know that um, they can do much better than allowing 1% of PFAS into the river based on the data available from the outfall, from the old outfall. We know they can do a heck of a lot better than that. And so the technology is there, the law requires they follow it. I, I do hope that that, that is considered uh, by DEQ and maybe suggested by this committee. Um, and, and one final comment, <laughs> just to make sure, I am a private well owner in New Hanover County. My well was sampled by Parsons. I have not heard from Parsons. I know that Secretary, Assistant Secretary Maysmore said that 16 of the wells um, data was complete. I just wanna make sure because I know from our history of communication with folks up in Fayetteville that sometimes Kim Wars is not so good about communicating with the actual private well owners. I wanna make sure that that's happening down here because I have not heard any 
response in terms of you know what's happened at my well and i have seen data come out in the press on on some wells so i just want to make sure that that's clear that deq is holding them to to communicating with the well owners before they communicate with with anybody else um and that's it for my comments thanks very much and i appreciate and i, and I look forward to your answers to the to the first two questions thank you for questions two and four that relate to deq's path forward um, we may have to have them get back to you remember i was telling you that shishma was going to be here for the beginning of the day and maybe the end but she is at the annual environmental council of states meeting um, and those questions that are related to where dwq is headed well, it may be important for the science board to hear. We may have to wait for her to check in on that. But the first one is certainly directed at Amy in terms of the classifications for the presentation, which is timely. So I'm glad we could have that one to deal with now. Okay. Yes. So thank you for, for the question. As, in terms of legacy PFAS, I think of the, um, the carboxylic acids and the sulfonic acids. So carboxylic acids, including um, PF perfluorinated carboxylic acids, including PFOA, and the shorter and longer chain carboxylic acids such as um, PFBA and PFHXA, and then longer ones such as PFDA, PFNA. And then similarly for the sulfonates, I think of PFOS, the eight carbon um, compound, shorter chain sulfonates such as PFBS, PFHXS, and then longer sulfonates such as PFDS. So um, that's really what I'm talking about with legacy PFAS and, and with Camor's PFAS, I'm thinking about and meaning compounds that specifically originate from Camor's. Yes, some of the legacy PFAS do also originate from Camor's, but there's all other sources as well. So the legacy PFAS I'm thinking about Camores may and does contribute some of those PFAS, but other sources up and downstream also contribute those PFAS. Not trying to say that Camores doesn't discharge some legacy P PFAS, only meaning to say they're not the only ones that discharge those PFAS. That that's the distinction. The Camores are um, originating specifically from Camores compounds such as Gen X, PFO2, HXA. Um, and PFMOAA. Thank you, Amy and Dana for the input. And on point number three, uh, thanks for the advice to the board to be uh, cognizant of the different management approaches that could be taken uh, for what the science is showing us. So thank you, uh, Dana and Amy. Again, there was one more person who had signed up to speak on this particular topic, and I'll give them the same offer. It was Gary Gupton, who was representing himself. Um, is Gary available now? And I'll give the choice to speak now or at the end when it was originally scheduled. Uh, really, don't Gary, you will, yeah. I'm muted. Hello? Is this Gary? This is Gary, yes. Uh -huh. Hi. Tell me how close I came to being right with Gupton for the last name. That is absolutely correct. Thank you very much. You didn't put an M in the middle. Some people call oh. me Gupton, so thank you. You have the floor, and if you could keep it to about three minutes, that would be appreciated just so that we can try to make sure we have time for the next presentation. Oh, I can probably keep it to one. Oh, um, well, take your time. Uh, I wrote, I wrote some, some comments in there, but it's just really thanking you for all the information, Amy. That was Wonderful. Um, my wife and I just come back from getting our booster shots uh, COVID in Town Creek, so I missed part of that. But um, I'm hoping this is recorded so I can go back and get some of the information and uh, possibly do a little article in the our Magnolia Greens uh, Leland newsletter just to get a little information out to the public. But it's so much information that uh, it's going to be hard to sum it up in a short uh, article to to let everybody know what's going on. But um, I thank you for this, and um, uh, we'll try to kind of concentrate and understand it over time. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you for your comment. And it's certainly recorded. Um, is the intention for the slides to be available as well? Oh, uh, yes. Okay. Yes. So um, that has been a benefit for anybody who's followed this for a while. Uh, I've referred a couple of times to the presentations and spreadsheets from 
the EQ on um, a combination of prevalence of compounds and groundwater, surface water, and uh, uh, blood serum, I think it was, and then also uh, information on uh, toxicity of those compounds and for which mammalian toxicology data might be available. So all of those presentations, as well as the presentations that we have on the process for deriving guidelines for surface water and now fish uh, are available at the Science Advisory Board website. Uh, so thank you, uh, Gary, for the comment. And uh, thank you again, Amy. Thank you. Uh, with that, I think we're moving on to the last presentation of the day before we get to the public forum at the end for anybody else. And this one also comes from uh, Division of Environmental Quality, um, the other half potentially of the risk assessment paradigm now that we've taken a deeper dive into some of the exposure information would be on those for which we may have effects data with which to derive guidelines. Uh, this is a presentation by both Sushma and uh, Dr. Franny Nilsson. It's my understanding that because of Sushma stepping away that perhaps Franny is, be, is going to be here um, to do that. But I'll just turn it over to DEQ and then you guys can take it from here. And again, for board members, I encourage you to capture your questions in the chat and we'll make sure that we get to those. Hello everyone. Um, so my name is Franny Nelson. I am the environmental toxicologist at DEQ and I am going to give this presentation today um, because Sushma is at the Environmental Council of States meeting, but um, we did in fact make this together and she will be um, listening to this recording as soon as it's available to answer any questions that are um, directed at her. So um, just for um, Dana Sar Sargent to have that information, Sushma will um, hear and respond to your questions. Um, so let me just set up my slides real quick. Okay. Um, can everyone see the slides that I'm, or the cover slide that I'm sharing? It looks good for any thanks. Um, great. So this um, this presentation won't take very long, but I wanted to take a few minutes to kind of bring a lot of the things that we've talked about over the last six and eight months together and to talk about how DEQ is moving forward in scoping um, ways to derive reference doses for some of these PFAS compounds. Okay, so in the last presentation or the last series of presentations we gave at um, the February meeting, we heard from all three of our standards development programs. So groundwater, surface water, and the drinking water programs. And the common thread between all three of these programs and what is really needed to begin the standards and rulemaking process is a reference dose. And so a reference dose is essentially the concentration at which health effects begin to occur, and those are usually put out by EPA or ATSDR or other, um, you know, tox assessment kind of agencies. And so in order for DEQ to make any kind of rules or laws around these PFAS compounds, we need a reference dose. This is also relevant for the work that Kennedy described a few hours ago with the fish advisories. They also need reference doses to implement Fish advisories in North Carolina. Now, this is a sampling of all of the PFAS that are available in North Carolina. Um, these are the most prevalent PFAS throughout North Carolina, um, but not all. And these are those that have been sampled in more than one environmental media and or by more than one sampling agency. So either more than one of our divisions or a division in collab or in tandem with the PFAS collaboratory or NC State. Um, 
these, um, the big table that I presented in August and then again in October is a source of, of this information. And then I also have the very long list of all the PFAS that have been sampled or reported in North Carolina at the end of this presentation, just uh, for reference. And so while these are all the PFAS in North Carolina, not all of the PFAS in North Carolina are going to be taken up by the EPA. And so on each half of the slide, um, they're separated by those that are included in the, PFA, in the EPA PFAS roadmap and those that are not. And so you'll notice there are two different colors here and the darker green are the legacy compounds and the lighter green are the Camors or consent order specific compounds. And just to um, provide a little more information about legacy compounds, since there was a question about them, legacy compounds are essentially defined as either terminal PFAS, so those that don't degrade further in the environment, and or carboxylic perfluorinated carb yeah perfluorinated carboxylic acids of eight or more carbons or sulfonic acids of six or more carbons. And so there's a, a chemical structure definition that goes along with that as well. Um, and then the replacement or the, the alternative PFAS are shorter than those for both the carboxylic and the sulfonic acids. And also the degrade in the environment. Um, but so you can see here that the, the PFAS that the EPA will be taking up um, are nearly half of the top 20 that are most prevalent in North Carolina, including Gen X, which is great news. Um, those that the EPA will not be taking up um, are on the right side of the screen, and you can see that several of these were just presented by Dr. Delinsky as those that are quite prevalent in the lower Cape Fear. Um, and so as we move forward, what DEQ is really trying to ascertain is that what compounds really are a priority for our regulatory efforts, and do we use the PFAS that are at this nexus of what is frequently detected and those that we have the most data for, or is that not the most appropriate approach? How do we narrow down this large group into those that we have enough information to create standards for? And so this is a, a very wide lens snapshot of this big table that I made. And the point here is not really to show you any of the information that it contains, but more just the coverage. And so this is the list of um, the most prevalent PFAS. And then if we kind of remove those that the EPA is going to look at, we're left with this smaller group within the table. And so, um, looking that a little closer, you can see that there are some some similarities between many of these. Um, and these uh, PFAS with the purple stars and in this purple box um, were those that were just presented by Dr. Delinsky as those that are prevalent in the water in North Carolina in the lower Cape Fear. Um, the red star here by PFHPA is because this is the one of these compounds that, um, while is not being taken up by the EPA, has actually been the only one of these PFAS that has been regulated by other states so far. And so there is more information for PFHPA than there is for many of these other newer alternative or consent order compounds. Um, and other states have actually made standards for that. Um, sorry. Nope. So in the coming months, um, the Division of Water Resources is going to be sampling a lot of these groundwater wells across the state that are within the division's monitoring network. And the results of this will also provide some additional information on the type and concentration found in other water bodies across the state. Um, but right now with the information we have, these are the seven that are most prevalent in water samples. And so I just keep making this table smaller so it's easier to look at, but um, this is the group of the seven compounds. Um, and you can see if you just look across the table, the, the gray boxes are the spaces we don't have information for. And so there are some compounds that there is more information than there are for others. 
um, a lot of this beginning portion of the table. So this toxicity data, I don't know if you can see my mouse or, or not, um, but the toxicity data, a lot of this is computational. And so this isn't direct tox work. It's either computational or it was done um, using Gen X or another carboxylic acid as the surrogate for most of this group. So while there are a number of um, boxes filled in here, it's not always as specific to each compound as it, as it may appear. Um, another thing to note, um, the seven that are prevalent in the lower Cape Fear do have fewer data than some of the legacy, but there is information published and there still may be a large enough body of evidence to derive a reference dose for these compounds. Also of note here, of these seven, Comores will be conducting toxicology studies in both rodents and aquatic organisms for three of these as part of a consent order. They are not testing only three, but three that are included in this smaller list are within those that are Comores is required to conduct toxicity studies for. And so there will be more data forthcoming for some of these, and they are um, PFMOAA, PMPA, and PEPA, which were also three that Dr. Dilinsky just presented. And so, as far as what DEQ's request to the Science Advisory Board is right now, is that we really just want the board's input on what might be missing. And if there are PFAS that we have missed, should they be added to this list for North Carolina? And what kind of data exists for them? Um, I've done a, a, a fairly comprehensive search, but the search is not um, as up to date as, as the meeting date. So there could be some new studies that I am not aware of that have come out or some new sampling efforts in the collaboratory that I am not up to date on. Um, so if, if any of you have any of that information, I would, I would love to add to this table. Um, the second thing is, do we start with these PFAS that we, we know are detected and we have data for? Are any of these seven worth starting with or should we start somewhere else? Um, do we include the PFAS that the EPA will be producing toxicity assessments for, even though they are many years away from finalization? And then what, if any compounds should be grouped based on the availability of data? And so some other states like Massachusetts and Vermont, and I believe New Hampshire, um, have their own PFAS groups, and it's not a group based on structural similarity or um, you know, chemical structure or water solubility or anything like that, but they're the ones that they have been able to regulate. And so they have them regulated as a group based on their availability of data. Um, and then finally, what we um, really do need is the board's recommendation as far as what we should focus on. Um, what compounds does the board think should be prioritized for the initial standard setting action? And you know, is it just one we should focus on first, or should we start with a group of two or three or all seven? Um, how should we go about this process? What would be your recommendation for DEQ to move forward? And then also, what compounds should we prioritize for additional research? Um, we know that Comores is going to be conducting a number of studies for some of these. Um, we are also aware that a number of the Comores signature compounds are commercially available and that there is likely um, academic and outside research being done for some of those. Um, yeah, so we're just wondering what, what your recommendation is for how we prioritize the PFAS we're focusing on first and then which ones we should search for some collaborators to help us get some more data for. Um, and that um, that is that was it. That's all of my presentation for today. So nice and short. Um, and then I just I wanted to show just the length and size of this table um, that I made. These are all of the PFAS that were in fact detected in North Carolina based on presentations given to the board a little over a year ago. Um, and so you can see there are many more than were in my previous slide, but I chose those that were focused or that were reported in by more than one sampling program. And then these uh, seven green ones are the seven that um, we may focus on initially, but that's um, 
yeah, that that's all that I have. So I'm free to take questions or um, write them down and provide them to Sushma or the other leadership um, if they're more suited to answer them. Thank you, Franny. I'm going to suggest that we uh, do spend some time talking about your questions. I think there's enough there for that to be a separate charge to the board, maybe for a future meeting when people have the benefit of looking at your slides um, on a larger screen. Uh, but I do think that we'll have time to get some initial reactions, which would be helpful, maybe even in helping focus a charge. Uh, <clears throat> but just format wise, we need to spare some time at the end for the last bit of the public forum. And I think it would be helpful before people respond to these questions on the board, start a dialogue about them to see if there's any particular questions about the technical material that Franny conveyed. So let's spend a couple of minutes to see if there's questions. And then I'll be glad to open the floor for feedback on these particular on these particular um, questions. And I'm going to ask the first one. Uh, it's the first I think I heard about which particular um, PFAS were going to be the subject to testing. So can you quickly say which were those three that were from the overlap from the lists? I heard PF. MOAA, which was in fact one of the ones that was detected a lot. Uh, yes. So also, also in people, but I didn't catch the other two. Sure. So it's PFMOAA, PMPA, which is just the next one down on this list, and then PEPA, which is the fourth one. Um, those are three of the the PFAS that Comores is required to do toxicity testing on. The other, the others in that group. Um, are uh, one of the Nafion byproducts and then a PFAS that we consider um, a legacy PFAS. And I think that is mostly to serve as a basis of comparison for the others. Mm -hmm. Great. PMPA was another one uh, that when we had your tables from back in August that showed detections in ser human serum was, I think more than 50% of the time was the cutoff I used to get to a a list of compounds. It was PFMOAA, PMPA, PFO2, HXA, and NAPM byproduct 2 were the ones that I thought seemed like they were detected uh, more often than not. Uh, so let's move to a couple more questions, technical questions that would help inform the uh, short discussion we can have, and then we'll revisit this later. Other questions? Jamie, I think I saw you had a question. Yes, yes, this is Jamie. I have I have a question. Just some clarification. So, Franny, I really appreciated at the beginning how you outlined the requirement for reference doses, and I just want to make sure that I understand that requirement for reference dose. Does it mean that standards cannot move forward in the absence of a reference dose, and does it mean that there need to be adequate data available from multiple studies to select a reference dose that is most representative of the toxicity data being evaluated and considered for guidelines or health standards. So, yes, that is my understanding is that the way that North Carolina's standards rules are written, we do need a reference dose and that. Um, I know at least in in one of the standards rule um, language, there are several sources this reference dose can come from, and of course the EPA's IRIS assessments are the you know the highest weighted if they exist. Um, and there, you know, if you remember from the presentations from February, there is the ability of DEQ or you know other groups to aid in the derivation of a reference dose, um, and so that's. What we're thinking and, and you know scoping <laughs> of undertaking at this point for some of these more specific compounds, but yes, it, there does need to be adequate toxicity data, and whether that leads to um, you know adequate evidence for a certain health effect or enough data to use the benchmark Stokes modeling software like we use for the Gen X health assessment in 2017, um, I think that is a more um, more of a moving target exactly how and, and which, you know, POD or um, concentration is used, but I, yes, there does have to be a reference dose. So if I um, finally get my paper on PFMOAA toxicity submitted and it gets published 
and we report a, a no observed adverse effect level. And because this paper is on immunotoxicity, maybe there's a general understanding that this is a sensitive endpoint. Is it possible that data from a single study that's representative of what's understood about toxicity for PFAS as a class could be used to derive a reference dose? Or do you suspect that it'll take more than a single study or uh, at least a good agreement with some of the computational findings? I know that's asking a see into the future kind of question. Yeah, I think that it, um, this is something that we are, we're seeking the board's advice on. And so while DEQ has a lot of standards derivation and rulemaking um, experience, PFAS is certainly something that's new to most of the world still. And if there is, you know, a very comprehensive study that shows something, I think a weight of evidence assessment or some kind of meta analysis to compare the quality of that data would be appropriate. Um, agreement with computational studies or, you know, a lack of agreement. Um, I think it depends on the, the data and the PFAS and the endpoints truly. So I think it's, it's all individual. We placed a lot of weight in Gen X on two very well done studies. And, you know, we ended up using one of those, I think, in terms of the benchmark dose modeling. So I can't say what DEQ would, would use or how the board would advise, but I think Franny's answer is about where I would fall on it, that depending on the quality in terms of study endpoint, study design, doses measured, you know, one good study may be sufficient to cascade down through that sequence of if there's not an EPA value, an ATSDR value, and other states value that you could derive one as long as you had data that you were comfortable with. But there would be a lot that would go into that comfort level. My second question was quite similar to that though, Jamie, which was for NAFI and byproduct two, that's one where we have a couple of published endpoints already. Um, we heard from uh, EPA's Justin Conley um, at some point last year and then the year before on studies that were uh, included NAFI and byproduct two along with Gen X and then maybe one other compound. And there was some aspect there of comparative toxicology, but then there were also some um, that seemed like they could be used for reference dose modeling. There may be some pause about the duration of study. You know, those were gestational exposures, so maybe a few weeks in length. But they were certainly toxicologically relevant endpoints that had no effect levels and effect levels that could be the basis for modeling. Is there a reason in the table that um, maybe in byproduct two, uh, which is another one that seems to be detected quite frequently, including in serum, uh, isn't on the list? Is it just because it's a different class than the ones that you're highlighting here? No, not at all. And so when I kind of dialed this in closer, it was to highlight, pardon me, to highlight the PFAS that Dr. Delinsky identified as being very prevalent in our environment. But so if you just kind of look back at this previous slide, you can see NAFI and byproduct two, this last line on the table um, does have quite a bit of information for it. And Dr. Connolly's work is some that is cited here. And so I think that you know, those that are most prevalent in the surface water and the different water bodies certainly are one approach to focus on, but perhaps those that we just have more information on and that are also being detected in, you know, different media and then a human serum, is that a, a more appropriate or a more expeditious place to start to get some standards in development? Um, that's mm -hmm. part of our question, certainly. Other questions from board members relative to this presentation, keeping in mind those questions that we got asked, because um, now's your chance to ask questions to help refine your responses. And you can go ahead and flip to your questions, Franny, so folks can be thinking about what questions they have for your technical material relative to what's being asked of them. Hi, uh, this is Elena. Um, go ahead, Elena, thanks. Just jumping in because I had a question. Um, and, and it was the mention of Nathan that uh, brought this to mind is, and, and the reference to um, some work that was done measuring blood samples. Um, one, do we have a separate list or do we have something that puts us at the intersection 
of where there is tox data and evidence for exposure in the state or it's i mean if it's being found in samples that are the product of biomonitoring um that that would be something i would be interested in knowing So I know that the the two studies or two um, yeah the two studies that are looking at human serum have found um, different things based on what they were looking for. Um, the study from Duke found a lot of legacy PFAS that were reported so far, um, and then Dr. Hoppin's study did find I think NAFI and byproduct four in human serum. Um, what is tricky is that the, the Gen X study, so Dr. Hoppin's study, um, does not actually detect Gen X in human serum because it is metabolized and excreted so quickly. So there is certainly exposure for that, even though there is very little biomonitoring data for it. And so I think there is a useful discussion to have about what is you know accumulating in humans and what they're exposed to through their drinking water or surface water. Um, and where, yeah, where the nexus between those two things are. And I can certainly make a, a smaller table where that's highlighted. Um, I think that is a, a really good, um, you know, a useful visual to have, and I can certainly do that. And again, there's some of that um, in the original version of these spreadsheets for which there's a, uh, PowerPoint presentation that's been converted to PDF, I think, back at the August 21 um, meeting. So, but putting the pieces together, yeah, it might tee that up for the next call. Any other questions for um, Franny before we invite any feedback on the uh, board input that's sought here? This is Stat Life. Okay, go ahead. Um, not necessarily a question, but a comment related to, um, do we include, um, you know, additional PFAS? Um, there's, there's one subset, the multi-ethers that EPA isn't even classifying as PFAS with their definition. So. PFO2HXA, PFO3OA, PFO4DA, PFO5DODA all don't meet EPA's current definition of a PFAS, but we do see especially the longer chain ones in blood. And, you know, so that would be a group of chemicals where it may be necessary for the state to move forward uh on its own sorry i was just writing down you said um yeah i agree so there are those the pf o2 hxa and pf o3 oa o4 da um and o5 doa are are all things that are frequently found um and we know they're in our water bodies we have some data that they're in serum um Fortunately, some of these are actually commercially available. And so I think, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the longer them. ones that are toxicologically, perhaps the, the more concerning are now commercially available. Yes, and so I've, I've been working on updating our internal PFAS library with any kind of tox assessments or tox studies that have been done on, on any of these PFAS compounds that we've identified in water bodies. And so I, I can't remember offhand how many studies have these three in them, but I think that's certainly a, a worth a worthy place to start, even though they're not being, you know, officially defined by the EPA as PFAS, because they are in our water and they are in our population. And that's those are the two things that we use to measure exposure. So I think they are important, certainly. Thank you. Any other questions for, from board members for Franny on this presentation or 
uh, information that would help you respond to these questions. One example of that for me would be um, maybe it could be a meeting follow up that we could send to the board on the time frame for getting the toxicological results from those studies and then also what the study design is because I mentioned before, you know, in terms of picking a reference dose duration of exposure would be interesting. And so, like today, I have, you know, maybe a, a, a study that was at a critical window, but it might not have been very long. And if in the future I was going to get a multi generation reproductive effects study that uh, was maybe, you know, a, a better design for chronic exposure through drinking water, um, I might be inclined to wait a bit for it. But those type of things might be helpful in terms of what type of studies they're going to be. Um, doses, durations, and when they'll be available might be helpful to answer the prioritization question. So you don't have to answer that now because it'd be a lot to go through in terms of study design, but I, I think it would be helpful for information for the board. Anybody else on the board have something else that you would need to tackle these questions? I have, I have just one informational question about the slide with the seven compounds I, I identified. Go ahead, Tom. You could Thank bring you. that back up. Uh, the, the column uh, for the relative potency factor compared to PFOA. Yes. They're all the same. They appear to cite to two studies. And there's a, what is it, an apostrophe in front of the one? Does that, does that mean, what does that mean? <laughs> yeah, sorry, I had the footnotes, but I kept chopping them off to make the, the words a little more easy to read. Um, so this, yeah, the apostrophe was just denoting that it was a computational talk study, and these uh, were all grouped by class. So these are all grouped as uh, perfluorocarboxylic acids, and um, essentially Gen X is the one that the comp talks group has data for, and so that is the surrogate for most of this group. Why all of this is the same? I see. Um, yeah, so it's it's the data that we have, but it it's not um, as specific as I think we would hope. Now is it now you have data in in the mouse for the MOAA compound, and you have data in the zebrafish, a non-mammalian species. Uh, couldn't you? I would be surprised if you didn't have that for PFOA. Those two. Oh That's yeah, yeah. So PFOA has a lot of that. These were studies that were specific to these particular PFAS, and so the. The citation for 22 was that they were using um, Gen X as a surrogate for the the non-mammalian relative potency factor, and so the data was from zebrafish that they were modeling. Um, there is two mouse studies for PFMOAA, and then the two um, 24 and 25 down at the bottom with the asterisks. Those are forthcoming reviews um, from the EPA that you know have been. I guess. Or, All right. Thank yeah. you. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Any other questions, particularly questions related to information that you wish you had to answer the kind of budding charge questions there that Franny posed on the second to last slide? You can bring those back up. Yeah. You've got information on detections from a variety of sources. You had a series of presentations on the methodology with which the state derives guidelines, and you had presentations today on um, exposure data and a table which indicated those compounds for which we may have mammalian effects data. And some of that again was back in the data base from last August. Like I noted, the Nathian byproduct to um, uh, dosing at gestation. I have one more comment about this. Um, Please about go ahead. PFOA. It might be useful at least think about possibly adding one of the compounds that EPA is going to be developing a relative potency factor for using whatever methodology we end up going forward with on the ones that we don't have. It might provide some kind of validation of the approach to have a number generated this way, independent of what EPA comes up with with uh, what the agency ends up uh, producing. Yeah, I like it. That's a great idea. I think a lot of the toxicological studies pick a 
compound for which we know a lot and something with which you know very little and hope that you can do some bootstrapping there at the end. Yeah, well, validation is a tough, a tough objective and uh, it doesn't get a lot of attention. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Tom. Yep. Uh, anything else? We have a couple more minutes for anything from board members with either, either regard to these questions, which I think are probably you know, best visited in more detail uh, as a subject for a future meeting. But I welcome your comments on any of these now, uh, as we've heard from Tom and Detlef, and or anything else you would want to have uh, in preparation for the next meeting on this. And after a couple of minutes, we'll need to pivot toward the uh, public forum for the people that we haven't heard from yet. And so I can answer at least part of the question that you asked before, Tom, about the um, the design for the studies and the time frame um, really? for the, the studies that Camores is doing. Um, DEQ is in the review process for the um, we've done several revisions and you know new drafts with Camores and their contract lab for the aquatic toxicology studies, and those are. Pending final approval, so we're reviewing them and they will be getting started soon. Um, the rodent studies are a, a step or two behind that, and so we're reviewing the master protocols now and um, we'll have a meeting with Camores to, to discuss any comments or questions that we have. Um, but they, once they get started, um, we're hoping within, you know, 6 months to a year to have the data and be able to use it. Mm -hmm. I'll ask 1 more maybe to wrap us up. Uh, because it will at least help me think about this in the future. We definitely see how the reference dose is key to a variety of state um, mechanisms for this board to inform the state's work to then run through the uh, Environmental Management Commission to our mood toward having a new tool in the toolbox. And we remember from reference dose that at least some of those uh, regulations had a tiered preference for what the source of information would be. If you get to the point that it's, you know, derive your own, uh, is there any existing guidance or SOP that says how you do that? Or does the state have the latitude to derive that based on best professional judgment, you know, with advice from this board and other toxicological expertise that we often hear from uh, at meetings like this, whether they're in academia, other government agencies, uh, business and industry is there if you get to that last step where you can't find it available someplace else and you derive your own is there a set of rules cookbook or guidance on how to do that or do we just do the best we can so to the best of my, my knowledge there's no official cookbook for how to do it but um, the process for deriving a reference dose is pretty well established by the EPA and, and a lot of other entities. So I think the biggest um, piece of that puzzle that would have to have significant rationale is the accepted health effect or point of departure that the reference dose is being based on and the science scientific basis for that, um, as well as external entity approval or buy-in, I think, just to lend credence across um, you know, all of the different sectors. And so it's not something solely the DEQ is saying this is this is it, but we um, would want to work with the collaboratory and of course the science advisory board and um, other you know partners in academia and other federal toxicology um, institutions just to have as much I guess buy-in or review as possible um, mm -hmm. so it can be supported. Yeah, early on in Gen X and early on in hexavalent chromium, there were decisions about what process we would use. And so the board had discussions about in the case of hexavalent chromium, we, would we use EPA's guidelines you know, for deriving estimates of cancer slope factors or reference doses, or would we do something else? And we said, well, we'll agree to use that process. And so there's a transparency there and then a process to follow. I was just curious about whether or not there was anything that would be set in stone here. And it doesn't sound like there is. 
Yeah, so a give and take there. Well, thank you, Franny, for the presentation. And um, I suggest a path forward as this be a topic for the next meeting informed by the presentations that we've had, uh, a deeper look at the table, uh, some time to think about the table, some time for people to look at the references that are stated there with regard to sources of toxicological data and then revisit this at the next meeting. Does that serve the agencies um, if we do it on that time frame? I do believe so, and I, when we made this presentation, it wasn't with the intention that everyone answer the questions and we, we do this today. We definitely want the board to, to consider all of the information that has been provided in the last several meetings and I'm happy to kind of make some smaller summary tables or, or you know, visual tools to help with that. Um, and then I'll also pull the references that I've found recently about the talks information. Um, for some of these other compounds as well, and make that all available to the board, um, probably through our internal team site, just so it's um, easier to share without um, clogging up everyone's email. But I, yeah, I'm happy to happy to facilitate all of that and send it along. Excellent. Well, that's a good path forward. Thank you again for the newsy presentation and for the uh, teeing this up for additional discussion. It does represent, I think, a substantial evolution of. Um, this path toward both looking at exposure data, available effects data, what other entities are doing, and what's the best value added from North Carolina's uh, expertise and resources. We are moving now to the last item on the agenda, which is the public forum. And there was one speaker who had requested to speak on this particular topic. That was uh, Michael Waters speaking on behalf of Grace Creek Residents United Against PFAS and our wells and rivers. Uh, so, Michael, if you're available, um, we have about three minutes to hear from you. And remember, it's the, if it helps, it's the science advisory board whose ear you have right now. Um, we don't do the regulating, but we uh, are keen on any feedback relative to the science that helps us inform uh, management. So, Michael? Oh, that's Mike Waters. Uh, appreciate everything that you guys are doing. Uh, actually, you pretty much covered what my question was going to be. Uh, ref, you know, Dent left actually covered a lot of the stuff that we saw in our blood um, that you know the EPA isn't looking at, and that you know that's kind of concerning on definitely on my part. And then you know I wish they would look at one. There's two replacements. Or PFOA, Demer acid, but there's also Tremor acid, and I wish the discussion would start on that because it's used at the Fayetteville Works too, and it looks like it may be more toxic than Demer acid. Um, so that's that's one I wish somebody would recommend to DEQ um, that they look at Tremor acid as much as they're looking at Demer acid. Other than that. Appreciate the the WebEx today. Uh, very informational. Thank you, Mike, for your comments. And I'm glad that the back and forth of the board discussion got around to some of the topics that were uh, of concern to you or that you were going to bring to our attention. And um, welcome your continued participation as we tee this up again next time for what should continue to draw a finer point on path forward. Uh, Earlier on, I was asking if uh, Beth Marcasino was available to speak to the um, topic that she was keen on, which I think was the fish consumption advisories. It was not important that it happened then, it was just an offer. We are now at the portion of the agenda where um, that's still appropriate. So, uh, Beth Marcasino speaking on behalf of North Carolina Stop Gen X in our water. Are you available? Hello, are you there? Yeah, is this? Okay. Yes, it's me. Thank you. Um, so sorry, I was having computer problems, um, but thank you for allowing me to speak. So we've been in our water contamination now for almost five years, and other states are setting advisory limits on not only fish, but also deer and cow milk and food we're having um 
produce and vegetables and all of these things. Our state is lacking. And this is something I work a lot with minority communities. I work with um, Native American tribes that are hunters and gatherers. And this is something that is brought up in my group on a daily basis that we have no advisory limits. Um, the thing is, is that it's criminal that DuPont and Comores dumps PFAS into an, our environment. But I also believe that it's just as criminal that DEQ and DHHS, they know about the PFAS contamination and have not set any advisories um, or regulatory limits. And I really deplore DEQ and DHHS to act with urgency. I mean, Comores discharges over 250 chemicals and we've known about this since 2019 in the consent order. And all of these chemicals are toxic. And we must consider what all of these chemicals are doing to our residents and what their long-term exposure, what they are. I mean, these are things that we consume in a daily basis. And like I said, we need to act with an urgency and I deplore you to push this even more to DEQ and DHHS, whether they have to talk to other states. I mean, Duke University just put out um, a fish study and I get bombarded every single day. And it's something that weighs very heavy on my heart. Very heavy, if you only knew. Um, every time I go to the grocery store, every time I look at something, I'm always wondering what's in everything that I eat. So thank you for allowing me to speak. Uh, you're welcome. And thanks for the comments. There are, in fact, many media when we got start moving into multimedia. Uh, let's work with air, surface water, groundwater. Um, heard about fish um, early on. We had presentations related to soils and foodstuffs and uh, international efforts uh, to uh, address those as well as some in other states. So, yeah, there is a lot there. Um, and the science is growing and uh, I appreciate DEQ and DHHS keeping up with both the effects side and the toxicology side and helping us dial in on where North Carolina can be value added. But your comments are, are, are helpful in terms of um, continuing to uh, help the state balance the approach that they're taking to this and uh, other things that are on their plate. That ends the public forum. Uh, it's the end of our business for the day. Again, our next meeting is going to be on June 6th. The intention for that is to pivot to in-person meetings again, uh, ground floor of the Archdale building, much like they were uh, a couple of years ago. I think those will be uh, helpful from the standpoint of uh, information exchange. Um, if there's any concern of board members though, with that pivot, any concern with that pivot two months from now, uh, please let me and Franny Nielsen know so that we can work with uh, you or others to make sure that uh, that's in fact a good decision that we can plan for. That's the intention is to move to in-person meetings we need to hear from you. That's going to be a hardship two months from now. Uh, with that, I think it would be appropriate to entertain a motion for uh, adjournment today. Dave, Dave, I'll so move. Thank you, Dave. And did we have a second? This is Gina. I'll second. Thank you, Gina. Um, all in favor, I think we can just do that by raised hands on the screen instead of verbal voice vote. Looks like I've seen uh, a quorum there. I do thank you all for your participation in a long meeting today. Uh, a long meeting, but full of a lot of good content. If you think about that evolution of uh, looking through exposure data for thousands of compounds, um, 
and then where there might be a convergence of effects data, and then those for which uh, others are working. I do think it tees us up for a good discussion next time on how to prioritize uh, resources. With that, I'll thank you again, and uh, tell you we'll see you in a couple of months, and please do send your feedback about um, any limitations for in-person meetings coming up in two months. Thanks, everybody. Thanks a lot, Thomas. Yeah. Thanks, Tom. You're welcome. Thank you, speakers.